Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig Garber. You know me as host of the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, but when I'm not interviewing world-class guitar players, I'm busy helping clients with their marketing. In fact, since March of 2000, I've helped over 300 clients in 108 different industries all over the world sell everything from $20 books to $5,000 seminar seats and everything in between. I even authored a book about my experience called How to Make Maximum Money with Minimum Customers. Now, if you own or operate a business, ask yourself the following marketing-related questions and be honest with your answers. Are you generating fresh new qualified leads on a daily basis? Is your website generating enough sales? And if not, do you know why? Is your advertising effective? Is it predictably and reliably making you several multiples of what you're spending on it? And lastly, are you consistently communicating with your email list? Or do you have an email list of prospects and customers, but you have no idea what to say to them, how often to say it, or how to make money with this list? If you need solutions for these marketing problems, then you need to book a one-on-one -on -one marketing strategy session with me. After this strategy session, you'll know how to speak to and make money with your email list, how to use your website to attract customers and clients who are ready to buy from you now, and how to sell your goods and services for top dollar and at much higher profit margins than your competition. Listen, stop hoping things will get better on their own. Hope is not a very good business strategy. Instead, book a marketing strategy session with me by going to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing and find out if your business meets the five criteria you need to qualify for this service. Again, that's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing. Thanks for listening. Now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. And right now, while it's fresh on your mind, before anything else comes up, head on over to everyonelovesguitar.com and sign up to get behind-the-scenes information about upcoming guests and early access to a number of great programs we're rolling out. All righty. So today, I've got uh, just an incredible an incredible guitarist and a really great person. I want to tell you a story. Two stories, actually. I'm with the one and only Red Volkart, and Red is arguably one of the best Telecaster players around. And, and what's interesting is that everybody that I speak with knows Red. I was interviewing a guitarist from New York City last week, knows, doesn't play telly, knows nothing about country. And he said to me, oh, who else are you having on your show coming up? And I said, well, I got Red Volkart coming up. He goes, oh, the guy with the Telecaster? The red-haired guy? And I said, yeah. He goes, holy crap, that guy's a monster. And I'm sure if you ask people you know, especially professional players, everybody's heard of Red. The second cool thing I wanted to tell you is a little story about Red. So I was talking to a, a player, oh, <clears throat> four months ago maybe, and it's a guy out of Nashville, and he told me when he first came to town, he literally came to town with nothing. I don't think he had a place to stay. As what's the saying? He didn't have uh, a pot to piss in and a window to throw it out of. So he he happened to meet Red, and Red, correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm telling this right, you gave him a bed, a mattress, and a pillow. Yeah. All right. And did you and a place to stay? Maybe even or. Uh, no, I set him up with a place that, right. that was could rent him a room just to rent a room because he couldn't afford anything so he couldn't get a whole apartment or a house or nothing like that sure and um this guy and that i i thought that was such an incredibly kind thing to do because it that stuff you know when people enter your world like that it's a pretty big impact on you at that time in your life and today this player and has been an a first call session guy for many many years he's a tremendous player and he remembers that and talks about that all the time so when i heard that i said i got to get red on the show so man thank you so much for coming and oh, uh, it, i'm really happy to talk with you let me let me tell people about you in case they don't know red was born in british columbia canada when he was 10 years old he got a hand-me-down guitar from his brother and he started noodling around with it a couple of years later he discovered merrill haggard buck owens led zeppelin deep purple albert king and johnny winter he also got his first fender around this time and he really began to woodshed at 19, he moved to Edmonton, Alberta, and for the next eight years, Red was playing with a few different bands, playing traditional country and western swing music. In the mid-1980s, he moved to California, where he got to experience country, blues, rockabilly, swing, and jazz like he'd never heard or seen before. He was lucky enough to get to play on many demos and recordings of everything but jazz. 
In 1990, Red moved to Nashville and wound up playing for Don Kelly, whose band was launch whose band was a launching pad for some of the top guitarists in Nashville. Guys like Red, Brent Mason, and guys who have either been on this show or are coming on this show, like Danny Parks, Johnny Hyland, Daniel Donato, Troy Lancaster, and J.D. Simo. Red worked with Don on and off for around seven years. And if you've listened to this show in the past, you know the story of Don Kelly, but Don basically is a band leader who does exactly this. He finds the marquee guitar player and puts them on stage and they would shed and really get a great experience. And, and if they're great when they come on and they all are, they're 10 times better when they leave from 97 to 2003, red played with Merle Haggard. And after this, he wound up moving to Austin, Texas during this time. He'd still fly out to California for session work all the while playing in Austin and throughout Texas. And with a few other bands, he focused now on his own band, booking festivals in the U S Canada, Norway, and Finland. He toured Europe with Dale Watson in 2005 and his own trio in 2006. In 2009, Red got his second Grammy nomination and he won the Grammy for Best Country Instrumental for his work with Brad Paisley, James Burton, Vince Gill, John Jorgensen, Albert Lee, Brent Mason, and Steve Warner on the song Cluster Puck from Brad Paisley's album Play. So this is the company that Red keeps. Each one of those guys are pretty much legendary guitar players and and extremely successful and good guys too. He put out one more CD called Redhead, that's R-E-D-D, on his own Telehog label, recording with several folks locally as well as doing tracks and recording on other folks' stuff worldwide. He's been going to Australia every other year to play, teach, and do clinics, and he teaches lessons at home on a fairly regular basis. He's put out a couple of instructional DVDs in the last few years, and he still flies to Nashville to record periodically with Brad Paisley, Rhonda Vincent, Daryl Singletary, and many others, and he also teaches at the Folk Alliance in Kansas City in February every year. So here's a list of people Red's played with, jammed with, sat in with, recorded with, or backed up in one form or another. And I've trimmed this down by like 80% because the amount of uh, people Red's work with is phenomenal. Ray Price, Rose Maddox, Dale Watson, Commander Cody. You don't hear that name too often. Jim Lauderdale, Eric Johnson, the Hagar Twins. Johnny Paycheck, Johnny Lee. I interviewed Johnny's daughter on this show a while back. It was interesting. Uh, oh. s- yeah, Statler Brothers, Larry Gatlin, Merle Travis, Albert Lee, Vince Gill, John Jorgensen, Marty Stewart, Mavis Staples, Marshall Crenshaw, Hank Williams III, George Jones, Buck Owens, Merle Haggard, Dwight Yoakam, Trace Atkins, Tim McGraw, Allison Krauss, Charlie Pride, Asleep at the Wheel, Dolly Parton, Brad Paisley, Billy Gibbons, Sonny Landreth, Seymour Duncan, and Bill Kirchin. Man, Red, what a bunch of players that you have uh, grown with. Well, rubbed elbows with, anyway. Yeah, man, this is awesome. This is really cool. You've had a very robust career. Um, you, you, I really, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate your time, and I have been very much looking forward to this. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned on, on your bio that you moved to Edmonton, and that's where you learned a lot about music and about the music business. I was wondering if you could talk about this a bit. Okay. I uh, Yeah, I was around 17 when I moved out there, and uh, I was – you know, living in Vancouver, where I'm from. And I was working with a little band, a uh, drummer and a bass player, and the bass player's wife was a piano player. And they were getting divorced, so he wanted out of there real bad, and he wanted to move somewhere else. So him and the drummer said, hey, let's start a trio, and let's move to uh, the province of Alberta, to Edmonton. So they asked me if I wanted to go, and I thought, hell, why not? You know, <laughs> I loaded up my car, and I moved to Beverly, you know, and... uh <laughs> Went out there and played with this trio for a couple of years. It was a little band called Picker. And at the time, I didn't sing or anything. We had uh, the bass player sang 90% of the stuff, and the, the drummer sang a little bit, and uh, he about five or six tunes. So, of course, the bass player meets a young gal, and he decides to jump ship and quit the band, and so we're screwed. We don't have a singer or a bass player, so... We find a bass player, and, and he only sings about 10 or 15 songs. So they both gang up on me and say, okay, you got to learn a bunch of songs, or we're going to have to fire you. Fire you. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to start singing, so it was an instant hurry up. And of course, I knew a bunch of old tunes just from playing them with 
different people backing them up and you play them, you know, a hundred times, you can't forget them. So I remember most of the words. So I just started doing some of the old songs that I remembered and kind of worked into it that way. And then through that, <clears throat> being in a trio, trying to sing and play the fill licks and, and uh, the little lines behind the singing that you hear on a record is always, you know, older country music. Anyway, you hear somebody will sing a, a sentence and then there'll be some sort of a fill, whether it's a steel guitar, a piano, fiddle, regular guitar, something behind the singer. And that's, uh, for me, near impossible to do, to sing at the same time and, and finish the end of three words of a sentence and start a, a phrase that is in time and swings good and feels right and all of that while you're thinking of the next line to sing as well. So it's kind of a... Uh, two brain kind of a deal like a piano player. Piano players have always amazed me because they got the left hands doing one guy's job and the right's doing about two other people's jobs. So uh, I learned how to do that and really focused on practicing that. And of course, it took a long, long time to get even as bad as I am at it now, you know, but <laughs> it's one of those deals where I learned a lot of that. And also, I met a whole pile of new guitar players out in that part of the country and uh, traveling around, I played mostly in two provinces, Alberta and Saskatchewan at the time, and I traveled some other other ones later on, but early on was just those two. So I'm at a pile of good guitar players, and back then everybody had a suitcase, their own suitcase of clothes and a second suitcase full of cassette tapes of uh, music that you liked and listened to on your little cassette recorder <laughs> on the desk beside the bed. And... Uh, so we would swap tapes with different guys and, you know, somebody would say, hey, have you ever heard of this brand new guy, Albert Lee? You know, oh, yeah, I haven't heard of him. Oh, listen to this tape. So we'd burn copies of cassette tapes way before Napster. And uh, <laughs> I remember, man. T yeah. TDK. T yeah, I used to have a whole stack. I still do. Oh, yeah. All of, so I had lots of tapes to learn from. So I really worked on that kind of stuff. And, you know, in jam sessions back then, it seemed like everybody had a jam session somewhere sometime uh, up in Canada. When you played a bar, you played six nights. So you played Monday to Saturday night. And every every one of them at, in a tavern or a bar up there would have Saturday afternoon what they called a matinee. And you played three to seven as a matinee and that's where you would have kind of like you would have here a talent night you would, people would get up and sing and play and whatever with you so you would pull into a town with your band and you play for the week saturday a bunch of guys local guys that that played or weren't working or whatever in the afternoon would come by and get up and play with that band so i got to learn a bunch from those kind of folks too and meet a bunch of wonderful players through that and you know and then on uh, sunday it was your day off so we didn't have too far to go. We'd go to somebody's home and, and jam all day there and learn a bunch of stuff from those guys, you know. So I did that for several years there, and that's kind of where I got my uh, my yearn to learn more all the time from doing that kind of thing for several years up there and meeting so many folks that played different ways and different styles. And, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat, so you watch everybody how they do it and go, oh, how'd you do that? Oh, oh well, I start here. And I go from that to that, and that leads to this. And you go, oh, after a while, you learn a 100 of those, and pretty soon you go, oh, well, that's kind of like this one. That's kind of like that. And piece it all together and end up with a big, you know, bag of uh, dice with several numbers on them and to choose from, you yeah. know. when you So you left at 17. What were your parents thinking? Were they like supportive of that or i mean that's a you're at a young age to to do that very young age to to go on the well road. i don't i'd already been playing i mean i played my first uh my dad played guitar uh he started when he was 30 but he was probably when he was 35 he was playing professionally and uh so he kind of drug me into it a little bit and you know i wanted to play and so he'd bring me to a couple of gigs and of course the hook was in by then yeah so he was it. He thought, oh, I get this 12 year old kid, 13, he plays pretty good and he's eat up with it and can't get enough of it. And so he would brag about me to his friends and stuff. So he was all for it, of course. And uh, my parents were divorced. So my mom was like, well, whatever you want to do, you go ahead and do it. You know, you, you know what you're doing. You, you, you'll be able to make it right and all of that. So she was 200% on my side as well. So I didn't have any problem with that. As far as leaving, they just said, you know, call us if you need us. Good luck, you know. Right. That's really good. Yeah. 
my going away present was an electric frying pan, you know, with the knob on the side. <laughs> yeah. We ate out of one of those for years, me and him. You know? Yeah, that's funny, <laughs> that man. Present for moving. <laughs> So you so you really like pretty much twenty four seven were immersed in music and woodshedding during this whole three to four or five year time, and it really got you good, really good. And your it probably like your chops, your ears, everything was was working all the time there. Well, they, yeah, I was starting to. I mean, it t- it takes time for all of that stuff to kick in, and you figure out your pattern or your you know your stride or whatever you call that. You know, so yeah, I mean, I, I was into it full blast and that's all i did i'd practice you know eight ten hours a day sitting on the end of the bed in a hotel room on the road and then play a five-hour gig at night back then we played five-hour gigs it was wow. nice yeah so i got lots of time in practicing and playing and that's all i did nothing else you know so uh i did that oh probably into my 30s you know wow what, what prompted you to move to california and then to nashville I mean, well, I thought. I think, even though you weren't a kid at that time anymore, but leaving the country is a big thing. Well, I, I, to me, as a guitar nut, I wanted all the records and, and tapes that I had of all these wonderful players and stuff that I was mimicking and copying their stuff. I thought, man, it'd sure be cool if I could go down there and see those guys and watch them play and see if I'm anywhere close to the mark as far as you know. If this guy's playing a certain tune. If, how he does it, I watch him play. I could say, "Oh, he's doing it in the in the fifth fret, the same as I did," or "I'm totally wrong. He's got a way easier way of doing it." You know, that kind of that was my motivation was to meet some of those guys, or if not meet them, at least see them play and uh, drool over their playing and maybe steal some more licks from the real guys that wrote the record. You know, sure. that was my my motive and. Being that I'm from Vancouver, I thought, well, I'll swing by Vancouver on my way south and say hi and bye to my mom in case I get killed on my way down there. You know? <laughs> and then you went to California, and then it was, after you established yourself there, is that why you moved to Nashville? Same thing to see the see more of the, the original pickers. No, I mean, I, I was I hadn't had a really a pl- I wanted to go to Nashville eventually at some point anyway, so I didn't really have a plan, but I just kind of noodled my way down there, uh, you know, starting in Redding, California, because I heard Merle Haggard lived there. So I thought, <laughs> oh, I'm going to see him at the grocery store, you know, and then I'll <laughs> ask him if I can come watch him play. I didn't know anything about the business, that part of it, or any of that. Of course, he wasn't there. He's on the road all the time. Sure. But I, I started there, so I got a gig in a club there. I went to a jam session on a Sunday night, got up and played, and a uh, fellow really nice guy come up and says, hey, are you looking for work? And I said, yeah, maybe. What do you got? He said, well, we start here tomorrow night for a month. I can pay you 300 bucks a week. I said, hell, I'll do that. Sure. And what and year was, was that? That was in uh, 86. Okay. So, uh, you know, I was sleeping in the back of my truck, and I'd go to the truck stops because they had the $5 shower. And uh, so I was living on the cheap, you know, that kind of thing. And. So I just did that my way through California. I got down to L.A. and I got enough work down there that I rented a room from a drummer that rented out a bunch. Of, you know, he bought a big house and rented out a bunch of rooms to guys. So he lived there for free. And uh, so I did that. And I lived in Los Angeles there for almost four years, I think. Three years. And then uh, I just got tired of my truck getting broke into all the time and losing stereos. Ugh. Back then, I was, you know, I was a pretty sound uh, file guy so i had and back in those days i had really good alpine uh stereo system in my truck and so i went from like a twenty three hundred dollar stereo system i lost that when i when i moved there after about three weeks and then i went down to a 750 dollar one and then i went down to a 300 dollar one and then i went down to like a 150 dollar piece of junk and when that was gone, I just pulled up as many wires as I could out of the radio <laughs> pole in the dash, and I put a big cardboard sign on the dash saying, too late, you know. <laughs> do, you remember, on the dash. do you remember the, the Benzie boxes, though? The ones that, you know, I used to remember, I remember they, it was a Benzie box, and you'd slide the whole. Uh, oh, until much later. <laughs> no, that, well, I, I grew up in New York. I, I think I had one. Of, I had one of those in the 80s, but I, it was, imagine, though, you're carrying around a four pound stereo, like, 
you, you go to the movies, you got your stereo with it would have pain oh, in the yeah. ass. But yeah. yeah, I remember that, man. I remember those things later. You could take the slide the whole deck out, put it under the seat or in the trunk or yep. whatever. Yeah. So yeah. I just got kind of mad at that and thought, that's ah, maybe it's my sign I need to get going, you know. I wanted to go to Nashville anyway, so it was I thought, oh, that's a good enough reason. I'll just start heading east from there, you know. Very cool. But you got it's the same thing you did when you're in Edmonton. Though. It sounds like you really got your value. You, you, you're not a guy that sits around. You make you know you make hay while the sun's shining there, or you make opportunities for yourself. It sounds like. Well, I try, I've always tried that. I mean, I just I've always looked at it as a uh, being broke and needing to work all the time, kind of a person. You know, it just uh, never having that you know real good money or big money or any of that. And, I mean, I didn't own anything, any houses or any property or none of that kind of stuff. It was just suitcase, a couple of guitars and an amp or two. And that's about it, you know, a bunch of tapes. <laughs> so, you know, I work as much as I could and I just looked at it like, well, I'd rather play a gig for $50 or $40, $50 somewhere than to spend part of that sitting at home watching cable, sure. paying for people, you know. So uh, I would work as much as I could and I was single, so it was to me. It was like, why not? I got nothing else to do. Sure, you know, I'm home practicing. I might as well be practicing on somebody else's gig and just be polite about it. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> getting paid, for, paying, getting paid for tuition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So while I was in California, when I, especially L.A., I could work two two jobs a day. Uh, if I hustled hard, I could work two jobs a day. Uh, probably at least four days a week. So I played seven nights a week and then probably four afternoons where you'd play somebody's pool party or some kind of a fu private function or an afternoon show or something where they needed a backup band to back some other people up. And I just took anything and everything I could find that would come along. And, of course, for me, I was shitting in high cotton. I was making pretty good money then because I'm playing that much. And, uh course it costs a lot more to live out there than anywhere else so you know some of that went away but by the same token i got to buy a few extra guitars and you know uh, pawn shopping and finding good deals and stuff like that uh i would do that on my way to a gig you know in the afternoon because in la of course you got to leave at noon to, to get to a gig by nine <laughs> <laughs> you say, i mean you sound like a pretty you sound like a guy that's pretty smart like just uh not thrifty is the word but you know you sound like you're smart with money well, i'm a canadian so you know? I'm cheap <laughs> <laughs> okay so then you go to nashville and then what happened there well same kind of thing i wanted to i wanted to see all the great players there that that were living there at the time like phil ball was a wonderful guitar player and he's passed on since but you know, just there was a bunch of guys. Buddy Emmons, a steel guitar player, and all the steel guys on the Opry and the guitar players, Jimmy Caps and Leon Rhodes that played with Ernest Tubbs band. Or just a fun, unbelievable. So I just wanted to see those guys, and I thought, well, I'll go there, and if I can't get a job or anything, I'll just go home. I got a, my truck's running good, and I can still go home and kind of hopefully pick up where I left off if they all hate me here. Sure. And uh, so I did that, thinking, well, I'm just going to go watch and look, you know. And uh, I couldn't help it, of course. I went around jamming and sitting in and looking for work while I was there. Figuring at least I can uh, supplement my vacation while I'm in Nashville trying to get to the Opry and watch these guys play, you know. So I wound up working, and more work led to more work. And uh, it was rough at the very beginning because I didn't know anybody, and, of course, they don't know you and the local regular guys. And, you know, of course, if you're any kind of good, then all the guitar players, they don't want nothing to do with you because you might get their job. <laughs> so that, there's that. <laughs> and uh, But there's lots of – I mean, everybody is friendly and accommodating and that kind of thing, but uh, – if the higher the pay, the less the less uh, friends you have in, that play the same instrument. You know that kind of thing. Sure. So, uh, but I wound up getting some work. So I did some out of town work at first for a little bit, playing. You know, driving out to Arkansas and up to Indiana, whatever. Play some weekend gigs here and there, and it was all right because I had a little bit of money I'd saved up from L.A. So I was I had a good float to keep me going for a while and. So then I wound up getting a gig with Don Kelly at this place called the Stagecoach Bar Lounge, I guess it was called. 
and it's an old building. It's uh, the building is still there actually right now, and but it's some other kind of fern bar or something now. But it was uh, the stagecoach lounge was on Murfreesboro Road, and according to the history that I heard out there was that that particular building was a comedy club in the late 40s and 50s. And Andy Griffith did a bunch of comedy there and different folks and Goober and those guys. And uh, Then later on, it turned into a rock club. And I guess at uh, in the 70s, in the early 70s, maybe late 60s, early 70s, the uh, Almond Joys played there, which was wow. later. Brothers, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's a lot of cool history. In yeah. That. So the stage stayed the same from, I think, when it was a comedy club. It was low. It was maybe... Uh, eight ten inches off the ground the stage so it was a really low stage and a big dance floor area and uh, it probably seated maybe 150 people something like that so don kelly was playing there and he'd already been there i don't know 10 or 12 years at that point and uh so the job came open for a guitar player and i had been going to their jam sessions on monday nights they had a thing a talent night on monday nights so the way those guys there did their talent night was that they had people get up and sing, but if they knew other players, the guitar player and the drummer, they'd say, hey, come on up and play for a, a half a set. That way they wouldn't have to. They could go and drink, and you'd be doing their job, and they'd still get paid. <laughs> uh, that's how I kind of got into knowing some of those guys is through that kind of a setting. you know. So he did a Monday night thing there. So I had been going there probably on and off for three months, and uh, – worked out that the guitar player that he had at the time was, you know, young guy, he had a bunch of problems and stuff and drinking trouble and woman trouble and stuff like that. So he kind of had to let him go. So I had subbed for him a few times. Uh, one time when he was in jail for a week and uh, just different things. So finally the job came open. So Don said, Hey, you want the job? I said, sure. So it was six nights a week with him and he had the seventh night off. And they had another band that, that played what he called the Dark Knight with her off. And uh, so I played with that band as well. So I played seven nights a week there when I, wow. once I got a job. And then I got some gigs downtown and doing that and uh, playing. Of course, Broadway was starting to bubble and come back. So a bunch of the little bars down there at that time, music would start at 11 in the morning, usually a single or a duo. Uh, and they, they band, guys would play from 11 till 2, maybe uh, 11 to 2. And then somebody would start, and after that, maybe a duo or a trio would play from uh, 3 to well, 2.30 to 5.30. And then uh, another a full band would play 6 to 10, and then another band from 10 till 2. So... I started playing some of the uh, afternoon shifts with guys doing duos and trios and stuff like that. So I could work like 11 to 2, two and then 2.30 to 5.30. And then I'd go home, have supper, and then go play the stagecoach, which was 9 to 2. Wow. So you were working like literally 8 to 10 hours a day, actually playing 8 to 10 hours a day working. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Man, what a work ethic you have. That's so awesome. It's, I really respect that. Well, I just figured, you know, I'm, I'm a single guy and I'm trying to save money. And not only that, I'm I'm trying to get ahead and get noticed and, and, and uh, get better gigs and more gigs and get all the work I can and be a guitar player. That's what I came to do. So I figured there's no point loafing around and, you know, even, you know, stay at home or go and watch too many guys play. I'm not working or making any money doing that, so I might as well play, and hopefully I get to play with some of those guys. And, of course, in 11 years that I was there, I did get to meet and play with a lot of the folks that I just idolized and were heroes. So to me, it was like a dream come true for a Gomer guitar player coming from Canada to come down there and even get to play rhythm for some of these big shots. You know, it was awesome. So you were playing at all these clubs, and then guys, you know, artists would come into the clubs, and they'd say, hey – come to a session with me oh yeah you get some sessions that way and some road work or they're band leaders more than the yeah i mean some of the big stars they wouldn't go out that much because when they're you know they're already big and making big money why would they want to go to a little dive club and watch a band play sure. probably not 
the easy home with their wife and the girlfriend by then. (laughs) (laughs) So the band, so the musical directors or the band leaders would come in and then they'd see you and then. Yeah. They would say, Hey, our band's looking for a guitar player. I play with this guy. And would you want to be interested in doing that? Oh yeah, I would. And then they would hold auditions. So of course you had to do the cattle call and go through the auditions and, you know, same old deal. Some, if they were really about the music, they'd hire you for that. And if you're fat and bald, well, they're not going to hire you because you don't fit in the tight jeans and look good on the video. So you're out for that. But at least they still had to offer that up to people through the union because of the union thing. They had to offer an open uh, cattle call audition day. Sure. So you go to a certain rehearsal studio and then, you know, you'd be standing in a line in the hallway with your guitar and your amp and hear half of your friends all trying for the same gig. Interesting. That that's how that thing works out there, and then uh, chances are not all of them, but some of them they've already hired a guy that they want because it was a friend of somebody, friend of a friend. So that that guy's going to have a priority as far as getting in on the gig before somebody they don't know because they don't know how that person's going to act on the bus, get along with everybody if he's a shit, a drug a drug addict, or yeah. a drunk, or trouble. You know, because you're in a little tin can with eight or 10 other people traveling down the road on a bus. So if somebody doesn't get along with somebody, it doesn't take long for word to get out about that on, on people, you know? So they would audition everybody and they'd all show up, but they would also through experience say, Oh, that's that guy. He's the one that almost killed that bass player. And that bam, I guess, uh, thanks. We'll call you <laughs> that sort of stuff. So that's how I kind of, got a little bit of work that way it was through that and the same with the session thing recording somebody would say hey we're doing some demos and we're wanting to get you know Elvis to record them so can you play like scotty moore you know okay great yeah so do that kind of stuff but you got you play with some major people though um and in fact let's i want to ask you about some of them and if you can maybe for each of these artists if you could share a cool story about working with them um, and how you got the gig, and if you learned any lessons from them, like any takeaways, either performing wise, business wise, playing wise. Uh, let's start with Eric Johnson. Uh, he's a wonderful person, a really, really nice guy, and of course, an amazing player. Uh, I first met him, he came to my house when I was getting divorced because I was selling a bunch of gear. So he came and was looking at a 57 Stratocaster and he bought a bunch of a uh, couple of black face twins and deluxe reverbs from me. And, and so we're sitting in my garage, you know, and he was trying out the, the guitar and the amps and stuff. And so that's how we first met and got talking. And he kind of hit me to this uh, weird bunch of stuff about, about your gear where, um, you know, everybody jokes about him. His ears are so good, he could tell the difference between a Duracell and an Everetti battery. <laughs> that's a pedal. I think, I don't know if that's true, but I think if it's possible, that's the guy that could tell. He's got ears that are that good. So he turned me on to a bunch of little tricks and things about equipment. Like he would say, uh, mark your cables. And I'd say, no, what do you mean? He said, well, the, the cables, if you plug a guitar in just with a cord into the amp, play an A chord, then take the cable out of the guitar and put that end in the amp, turn it around, you'll hear a different sound. And I was like, ah, bullshit, come on. You must not have cable because you got too much time on your hands is what I told him. You know? <laughs> he just laughed. And he said, no, try it. Listen, he said, when nobody's around, it's nice and quiet, you can hear the difference. So, of course, I did. I played, Prank. turned the cord around. Wow. One way was brighter and more lively than the other. Wow. And it was like, you know, you know, I, I was amazed because it was like, uh, holy cow. I didn't know anything about that. And lots of folks don't and lots laugh at you when you try and tell them about it. So I've been a preacher of a bunch of that kind of stuff to my friends and different guys. And half of them laugh at me and go, ah, you're fucking nuts, you know, but. That's no, okay. that's great. I think that's, I never heard. That's wonderful. I'm going to, yeah, uh, I'm going to try it this afternoon. Well, my argument with him was that, well, how can you tell how your chord sounds when the drummer's too goddamn loud and the, and the bass player's got a thousand watt amp these days that you can't hear shit. You can't tell that difference. And his thing was, well, you got to do it at home by yourself 
with no sounds, no radio, no TV, nothing on, just you in the room, in a quiet room, and you'll hear the difference. And then once you hear that difference, you mark that chord. Either all your chords will be marked on the input end or the output end. And then you mark all your chords. And his theory to that was the best part. He said, you know how you play some nights, you play on a gig at a club that you play lots, and you play in there and you go, man, I didn't play very good, but my stuff sounded fantastic. And I'll say, yeah, I have about seven nights of those a week, you know. <laughs> he said, yeah. And he said, then the next time you go in, you go, well, I think I played pretty good, but man, I just couldn't buy a tone tonight. Something's wrong with my sound all the time. It just wasn't right. And I said, yeah, I have that more. And uh, he said, well, he said, I think that's kind of the problem. He said, if you put your cores always the same way and hook them up the same way, it makes sense that that's not going to be the problem if there is a problem. And he wow. said, I guarantee you, you'll have 75% better nights that are consistent if you do it that way, as opposed to just mismatching your cords every night. Man, that's you know? brilliant. So I was like, oh, okay. So I try and now, of course, that's what I do. And, and he's right. It was dead on. You know, so that way I have at least 75% chance of my stuff sounding good. Now, I need to practice and get better, but at least my gear sounds good. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's always like in any endeavor, it's always these little subtleties that the the experts know that make those big differences in, in, well, yeah, and it's because they've been in it too long and they're bored and they look for other things to fix. And, you know, it's like a mechanic if his car's running perfect. He's going to find something or something else wrong with it. So he can tweak on it just to get in there and yep. poke around. So I think players do the same thing. They, they want to make everything as good as they can and as perfect as they can. So at some point, they practice and learn a bunch of stuff, and then they go, okay, now my gear is not quite where I want it to be, so I, I'm going to try this amp and that amp. You buy 100 amps, and you try them all, and you, you settle on a couple that you really love, and same with guitars. And then, you, then once you have a bunch of that stuff that's really good gear, then, okay, what's next? Well, my pedals, then my chords. You know, then, oh, back to my playing. I've slipped a little. I spent too much time on that stuff. Right, <laughs> right. Wow. So that was, isn't that funny how you guys met when, so how are you, how did you sell gear back then? I'm assuming this was before Craigslist or? Uh, it was a word of mouth, another guy that knows him really well, that uh, is a big vintage kind of dealer, wheeler, dealer guy. Yeah. Told him, said, hey, here's this guy getting divorced. You probably go gut him for nothing. You know? <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So, and, and like I say, he's a really nice guy. So we got along right off. And and uh, I think the first time we played was uh, I was playing my gig at the Continental. And he, and Eric, he's just so nice of a fella and really timid kind of guy. He had his guitar tech call me. And he said, hey, this is Jeff, and I'm, I'm calling for Eric. And I said, okay, well, where's Eric? Well, he's here. I said, well, <laughs> why didn't he call me? Well, he just wanted me to check and see if it was okay if he could come and sit in with you tonight at your gig. I said, of course he can. He doesn't have to ask, you know. Well, he just he's kind of nervous about it. He didn't didn't want to bother you. Wow. And I was like, bother? Jesus Christ. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he came to Continental, sat in with us, and, you know, of course, played his ass off. It was wonderful. And, and then he's probably – we played together – I don't know, five or six times. And then uh, he called me his uh, ex-wife's restaurant burnt down. And uh, so they did a benefit for all the staff while they rebuilt the restaurant. And they could pay them their salary still while they were laying low uh, rebuilding the restaurant. So I went and played the benefit for that. And uh, we jam. My band would play before his. And then he did the last thing. And then we jam. He'd call me up and sit in with him on that. Then he'd come to some other clubs in town, Broken Spoke in town, and Ginny's Little Longhorn, and he'd sit in with my band and just get along great. He's just a wonderful guy and, uh, you know, help each other out a little bit here and there with, you know, playing and having fun. And, of course, I'm just standing beside him watching him play, and my jaw's on the floor most yeah. of the time. Oh, geez, how do you do that, you know? <laughs> I'll, tell so, you, yeah, inter- I'll tell you a very interesting story about him. The same – this is very ironic. The same guy you helped find a place to stay and give him a mattress. Yeah. 
had an interaction with Eric where he would did exactly what you said. He was so kind and nice to him. It really impacted him. Yeah. Yeah, really uh, ironic okay. how that works. Yeah. He's the sweetest guy on the planet. and I mean, he's called me himself, like, to do the benefit for his wife. He, was, he doesn't stutter, but he almost sounds like he does because he's so nervous about asking you for something. Sure, sure. Like, hey, uh, uh, this is Eric, uh, Eric Johnson. Uh, would you, uh, I, I was kind of wanting to ask you, maybe uh, well, spit it out. What do you want, you know? Uh, <laughs> well, my wife's restaurant, this and that, and went on. But he's that kind of real timid and like he doesn't want to offend anybody or hurt sure. things or have to ask for anything or that kind of. He's just real, you know, what do you call that? Polite, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Over polite. Yeah, it's tough. I, I have a hard time asking people for things. To be honest with you, I'm not real, and I'm a very direct, outgoing guy. But when it comes to that, I have a difficult time. I don't know yeah. why. I'm a fan. Albert Lee, talk about that experience. I met him in Canada when I was playing uh, for Calgary Stampede. Uh, I was playing in a band, and we did a a six till two gig. <laughs> Six and a half That's it? Six till two? You sla well, slacking? <laughs> yeah, it was, because oh. it was an hour on, hour off. Oh, okay. So, uh, and the Everly Brothers were playing uh, in the big banquet hall thing in the uh, at this Weston Hotel for a big, some kind of big private function party. And uh, so I went over there, and, and I was playing with this gal, Katie Moffat, who's a wonderful singer, songwriter gal from Texas here originally, and lives in L.A. And uh, she had been on tour as a solo person opening for them. And uh, so they came to see her play, and Albert was with them. So uh, we would played a set with Katie up there at this big thing, and, and – uh, I get down and I go sit down at the table and Larry London, the drummer, is there, the great drummer, and Everly Brothers, and meet all these guys, and she introduced me to them, and Albert Lee, of course, I'm shaking and shitting my pants at the same time, and, uh, you know, sit down beside you, oh, sit down, so I sit down beside him, and right away, I'm just like a dumbass, I'm, so, uh, you use tens or eights or nines, <laughs> engage the screen, you fix you got, and he's like, wait, 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 wait. He said, this is your gig. Let's talk about you. <laughs> that was like kicking me in the nuts, you know. It was like, you know, I wanted to get all his information, find out some stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scripts, you know. And he was like, no, 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 no. This is your gig. Let's talk about you. And I said, I got nothing to say. He said, well, I enjoy your playing. Sounds great, you know. And then somebody else came and cut us off and started talking to him. And that was it. So uh, the end of that, that was in probably – I don't know, 85 maybe, something like that. So about 87, I'm down in L.A. where he lives, and I'm on one of these little benefit shows that's going on at a Silver Bullet Club down there in Long Beach, and uh, he's play he's a guest player. It was a fundraiser thing, making money for something. And there was a core band, and I was in that core band that backed up all the guests that were going to hopefully raise money for, I forget what it was, for somebody had an accident and no insurance company owned. So he came to play. So he sat in with us and I was like, I couldn't believe it. He said, Hey red, how are you? I was like, what? Are you couldn't believe he remembered you? Yeah. He remembered me. I was like, what? How is that guy must have a mind like a steel sieve, you know, stainless. Wow. <laughs> Cause you had just really spoke for five minutes, literally. Right. Yeah. yeah. And he saw us play, but how, you know, how many guys has he seen play? Who cares? <laughs> yeah. You know? Like that. But anyway, so it was like, I guess, four years later, you know, and, and I hadn't seen him since, and he remembered me. And then I was like, oh, great, cool. <laughs> and then uh, I guess the following year at the NAMM show, he's at the Ernie Ball booth. So I go by there, and there he is standing, giving autographs and stuff. And, and I'm walking by with a buddy of mine, and he looks up, and he goes, red. I was like, <laughs> Like, wow, Seymour Duncan, same kind of guy. They got it. unbelievable memories, you know. So that's kind of – we didn't do much playing or nothing, but I knew him from that. And then here uh, – Well, Red, in all fairness, you are a pretty unique guy. 
I know I don't and, look like every other truck driver. I know. Well, <laughs> and your name is easy to recall and match with your personality and your 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 looks, right? And you play very very well. And you know when you want to, you're the guy people want to remember if you're a player. I don't know about that, but you know, I just I just think of yeah, I don't look like anybody else. I guess if that's good or bad, but the, no, it, no it, it's it is what it is. But it's yeah. like it's oh, easy to tie the, it's easy to tie red to you and to to remember who you are and where you you know where the what the encounter was. Yeah, you know yeah. There, he's not he. It's easy to remember you. It's not like he's thinking where do I know this guy from? I must have bumped into him in Macy's. It, it, the tie, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's only one that looks like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The tie is easy. We'll so here was a year ago or two years ago, or I'm teaching up at the Folk Alliance at, in Kansas City, and he was one of the guests on there doing uh, clinics, and he did a show. So myself and Bill Kirchin were doing a bunch of teaching up there, and, and uh, we run into him in the hallway, of course, back and forth between teaching things, and, oh, good, good to see you. Hey, well, I guess we're going to play together on Friday night. Oh, really? Oh, okay, great. And uh, so he's like, okay, great. That's awesome. So we get together and we did this little set we played for, I think there's a YouTube of it, uh, of us plus my Kirchin, Bill Kirchin, Albert Lee, and myself, just the three of us playing. And we're up there wanking on electric guitars and doing it. Each guy does a tune. You know, we, I don't know if we did three or four songs each. And, and that was our, our little show. So that was the last time I played with him. It was a year or two ago. Wow. And it was awesome. Of course, he plays every bit as good as he ever has or better. And just a wonderful guy and just same old deal. Just a great guy. Now he's originally from England, right? Yes. Yeah. Which is interesting in and of itself because country music's not, and, you know, Telecaster country music's not really big there. No, or it wasn't when he was growing up. Sure. Of course, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with his Heads, Hands, and Feet band that he played in. No. Uh, an early band they had three albums out from england and they were well they were popular over there and kind of undergroundy here and uh it was a really good band the records are great and of course you can hear the full-on albert lee thing but he's one of the i think country boy he did a i don't know if it was on a gut string or an acoustic guitar on he had a version of his song he wrote country boy that yeah. ricky Sketch did and he did of course and uh that was on that uh, one of the heads hands and feet album and there's to... stuff where he, obviously he's the star guitar player in, on the records, and uh, it's amazing playing way back then. I'm gonna uh, have to check that out. I just wrote it. I want it in the seventies. Wow, John Jorgensen. I actually think I'm having John on this show in about two or three weeks. He's a wonderful person as well. Just a great, kind, giving guy. He's awesome. We played a gay bar in uh, Los Angeles for quite a bit together, and. uh in the eighties was, uh, him and myself and, uh, Jerry Donahue were kind of the, this gal named Kathy Robertson's a wonderful country singer, kind of Patsy Cline. She did old country stuff and rockabilly and she would use two out of the three of us all the time and a steel player. So it'd be two guitars, steel, bass, drums, and her singing. And she had this standing gig at this, uh, bar in, in Los Angeles called the Rawhide. And, uh, so we played there. It was a Monday night gig. And so we'd bounce back and forth. Some weeks it would be John and, and uh, Jerry, and then it would be me and John or me and Jerry. and Just mix them around, whoever could do them at different times. And So that's where I met him as we got to play together quite a bit then. And he was just a great guy, of course, unbelievable player on a thousand instruments and just one of the guys everybody hates for that. You know, <laughs> Just a wonderful person. And uh, it was awesome, you know, and, and we got along great. And Oh, he was always doing big stuff back then, even. Uh, it was before the Desert Rose Band, but or the Helicasters, actually. And uh, so we did some stuff together, the three of us, before the Helicasters. We played a, a G&L Christmas Party, which was uh, Leo Fender's other company mm. for Music Man, you know. So I got to meet Leo Fender, and it was because of him. You know, that kind of stuff. And he's always just been that kind of guy. He'd, hey, we're doing this fun thing. You want in on it? Sort of a guy, you know. And it's always fun to play with him. He's just such a sweet person. That's cool. Do you guys still bump into each other now and again? Oh, yeah. We played uh, up in uh, Denver at this thing called the Copper Mountain. 
it's a big uh, guitar geek festival that's for two or three days up there and you you go and you play and and do guitar clinics during the day and it's just a guitar nerd fest that's awesome it's called copper yeah. mountain copper mountain so let me ask you was this recently uh this was uh two years ago so was weed legal then in colorado like no no not not yet, because I'm wondering, like, man, it's got that place has got a reek of weed. If if there's like a festival kind of in, environment, well, it was music, so you could smell it for sure. Yeah, yeah. I was. God. We were there about a year and a half ago, man, and I don't really have a good sense of smell, but my wife was everywhere. Like, man, it smells like every on the highway. She goes, man, you smell the weed. Yeah. <laughs> Just driving yeah. down the highway with like little patches, you know. Yeah, it smell like somebody hit a skunk. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Buck Owens, talk about a player. Yeah, um, that one was, was actually was a, a a tribute to Johnny Paycheck CD that I played on, and he was one of the guest singers on the thing. But I didn't get to see him do it. He came in, or he did his part at home in California and sent it in for that. Gotcha. And then, but prior to that, when I was with Merle Haggard, I met him at his Crystal Palace club, mm -hmm. but I didn't get to play with him uh, on the stage with him. And, you know, I didn't put Merle Haggard in here, but I don't, I, it was an oversight on my part. Let's talk about Merle. How did you get that gig and what was, what did you get out of that experience? Oh, it was awesome. It was wonderful. I, I was playing in Printer's Alley at a club doing a, uh, what was it? 9.45 to 2.45 in the morning gig. Hey, I'll tell you, you talk about other people's memories. Your memory is spot on. You're telling me times of gigs that you played. <laughs> it, you know, I mean, I was pretty impressed at your memory. So go, go ahead. Sorry, but you have a great memory yourself. So I had this gig at this little club, and I was playing with a trio. And when Merle would come to town, of course, they would do TV shows and radio things and all of that. And a lot of that stuff is done like at 5.30 and, or, you know, that kind of midday kind of time. So the band would have the nights off pretty much. And, and uh, they go buzzing around town seeing who's playing and watching jam and same old thing. So a bunch of the guys in his band had come into this little club that I was playing at. And Clint Strong was one of the guitar players in his band at the time. And, and they'd come in and hang out, and he'd get up and jam, and different guys, a bass player, would come, and drummer, and this and that. And So I got to know a bunch of the guys in the band. So when the chair came open for the job, uh, I guess Merle had said to the band, who do you guys think I should get? And five out of eight of them said me. Wow, that's awesome, man. Luckily, because of them coming in there and hanging out and getting along, I guess, you know. That's fantastic. What was that? Ex How long were you with Merle? I was with him on the road for, I want to say, five years, maybe six. And then after that, I recorded, I would fly out to California to record with him probably for another three years after that. Which is unusual because I'm assuming he would be on Nashville kind of programming where you got a session guy and then you got a touring guy. No, he's never been that guy. He's, oh, he's always been, it's like Buck Owens. He's always been his own guy's. Nothing wrong with my band. Why would I use those guys? No offense. You know, yeah, that sure. Guy. Sure, sure. And those guys back in the 60s, that's why they they sounded so different. And they were the, you know, fuck the establishment kind of people back then. Sure. So when Buck Owens became huge and Merle Haggard and all the California guys, that was because they wouldn't go to Nashville to record and use the A team or the B team. They wouldn't do that. They would use their own people because – they know the songs already, and why bother? You know, sure. and what, for them, their thought was like a lot of people think. You know, you listen to the radio today; it's the same band. They just plug in a different whiny singer. Yeah, it's the only difference. It's the same thing, though. The same guitar players are on it. Same three guys. The same three bass players. The same three drummers. It's always the same uh, people in the background. So. Back then, even in the 60s, they were like, nah, that ain't going to get it. We want to have this honky-tonk Bakersfield sound, which they ended up, I guess, coining the phrase or making it happen that everybody else coined the phrase because they used their own guys. So he was like that till the end. He only did three or four albums where he recorded in Nashville with session guys there. And that was because of producers demanding that he did that. Interesting. 
Got any cool yeah. Merle stories? Oh, he was just an awesome guy. I mean, I, I, uh, even though he's gone, I could tell a few, but nah, <laughs> I don't want to tell those kind. But he was just a wonderful person and a real peaceful guy and easygoing and, like I say, a, a, a unbelievable band leader, songwriter, singer, guitar player, all that stuff, producer. And I learned a lot from him uh, about recording techniques and things that how he would do different things and and uh that maybe a lot of guys do but i didn't know about some of these things that that i learned through him and uh just his producing thing alone was like wow how cool is that he would come in with a song and pick up acoustic guitar and play the song and sing it uh and say okay i'm thinking about if we kind of have this sort of feel and he would strum the rhythm or the pattern, and so the drummer would be okay. Oh, I get that, and, uh, and then he would say, "I think maybe I'm hearing a piano or a steel guitar on the introduction." And so every, we would play the song with the piano doing the intro, then a steel doing the intro. So he left it open, but he would say, "I want the piano or the steel," but he didn't say, "I want it to go 15, 11, 45, 22, 55, one." He wouldn't say, that's the chord pattern. Hmm. He would just say, I want an intro that's this. So he would leave it, a lot of stuff up to the band to come up with some of the music for the, I mean, of course he wrote the tune and the melody. So common sense tells you to play something related to the melody when you're making an intro or an ending or a solo or whatever. So everybody know, knows to do that, hopefully at that point. <laughs> and, uh, so he would just suggest, like, well, I think maybe it should be this or that here. See what you think. And then we'd go through it once and twice and, okay, let's try it with the steel now. Okay, go through that. Uh, I think let's stick with the steel this time, you know, and, and kind of do it that way. So that's how some of these songs came to be. And he always did things sort of that way. So it seems like I'll bet a bunch of the other stuff early on that, that's so great and landmarky is is done that same way because he was so easy going about it and he kind of let the band have a lot of input into the sound of what kind of was the Merle Haggard sound. So it's very collaborative on his part. Yeah. You know, you could see, you could understand with that being his process why he wanted, he needed the same guys all the time because it, it wouldn't make any sense Otherwise, based on how his style was, his leadership style of production. Yeah, because otherwise, if he'd used the Nashville guys, it would sound like every other Nashville record with the number four intro and the number seven ending and on and on. It's like telling jokes in prison, you know. <laughs> telling jokes in prison. Brad Paisley. He's an awesome guy. Another one. He's just a great guy. And, of course, a marvelous player, singer, songwriter, all that stuff. Now he's a big mogul guy, but uh, I used to see him when I played at Roberts Western Wear as a bar down on Broadway. With Don. In Nashville. Pardon me? With Don Kelly, yeah. yeah. And uh, he would come in, he'd just sit over on the side by himself and watch, never say a word, nothing. Once in a while he'd come up and he'd bend over, he'd look down at my pedal board and see what I had for pedals and look at my amp and just guitar nerd, you know. I never thought anything of it because I didn't know it. He's just another young guy coming in there and looking at old guys' guitar stuff, you know. <laughs> so later on, I moved to Texas. I come to Texas here, and I'm playing at this little bar, Jenny's Little Longhorn. And uh, his steel guitar player at the time is still with him, Randall Curry, uh, calls me up and says, hey, are you playing tonight somewhere? I said, yeah, I'm at Jenny's tonight, 9 to 1. He said, okay, yeah, we'll probably come down and see you. I said, okay, well, what are you, who are you with? Oh, I'm playing with a new guy from town. I said, okay, cool. So they come down and hang out, and of course it's Brad, and I could recognize him, but it was one of those, I think I know that guy, I'm not sure, you know, kind of deal. Because it had been, I don't know, six years, I guess, maybe. And uh, so we reintroduce, and hey, oh, yeah, 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 blah, blah, Nashville, Roberts, pedal board, uh, pickups, guitar, nerd stuff so we talked of course hit it off great and and uh that was that so then he's dating his wife at the time or wife now but girlfriend at the time and uh 
Kimberly Williams. She's an actress who was in something about Jim or it was a TV show. And she was the daughter and father, father of the bride with Steve Martin. And, uh, so she was in Austin, uh, making a film, doing a movie of some kind. So he calls me up on the phone. He says, Hey, uh, I'm coming to town and I would like to come see you play. And I said, come see me play. Well, come sit in, bring your guitar. Well, I'm riding on my wife's back, so I won't have any equipment with me. And and it's her dime and her, her uh, movie that she's doing. So I can't bring any gear with me. I said, well, I'll bring you a guitar and an amp. Oh, okay, great. I'll come. So I was playing this little club called Egos at the time. And so he came and he sat in and, you know, a few people knew who he was because he wasn't huge, huge yet at that point. He's still wearing a ball cap, not a cowboy hat. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we've been good friends since then. And, and uh, he would come to Continental by, if they were coming through, they would play the, the fairgrounds for the rodeo. Of course, he'd always call me and say, hey, come, come sit in with us. And it's like on his big concert, I'm going to sit in. Right. So, of course, I go, yeah, why not? I'll go there. I'm, I'll, why not? So I go in a play, and that, that happened a couple of times. And then, oh, he calls me up. He says, hey, I'm getting married. Would you play my wedding? Like, wow. <laughs> hey, sure. So I took my bass player and my drummer, a trio, and we used Randall, the steel player. That was the wedding band. Flew us all out to Ventura, California, and we, I don't know whether they rented a place or something. It was next door to Kevin Costner's place. There you go. So I went over to his yard and stole a little stick of, of driftwood to bring home. So I, had, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it was awesome. Of course, all of her movie people were there, and Jim Belushi, and uh, oh, I think it might have been some of the Star Trek guys, and just a bunch of people were there, and and uh, they all get up and jam. And John Goodman, he plays harmonica, and just a bunch of people. It was a really fun wedding, and uh, so that was an awesome event to have happen and the guy just called me out of the blue to do it very cool pretty cool and then uh and he's came you know when he comes through town like i say he calls me to play and last summer in july i was in norway playing a, a music festival there with a band uh sitting in with a band that you know brought me over to play with him and he's the headliner on the show so same thing hey you want to play with us so i get up and play with them there that was this last summer. That was the last time I saw him. But just a great guy and real accommodating, easygoing, loves everybody, real laid back, uh, just a wonderful person. And just a guitar nut. I mean, he loves talking about pickups and wire and different kind of values of the pots and the guitars. And he's a gomer like the rest of us. He can't hide it, you know. How did how did what was that like on playing on his record on on Cluster Puck? That was fun. It was, you know, real fast tunes. So you had to think about what you're doing. You know, every so I, to me, it's kind of a deal of it's a real fast, hot pick and tune, and everybody played real fast stuff. So if I wasn't a guitar player, I'd say that sounds like the same guy just going nuts, you know, hearing all those people play on there. Did you have everything worked out ahead of time, or did most of the guys have all their parts worked out ahead of time? No, I think a bunch of the guys mailed in their parts. Like they would send them the tracks and they'd put their piece down and then send it back. And then they would edit and do that kind of thing. Is that what you did? Uh, on the I think on the cluster block one idea. Before uh, we did another one, we got nominated, didn't win for the song called Spaghetti Western Swing. And uh, I flew out there to do just that with him and, sit in the studio and play with him. And it was awesome. You know, sitting beside him, chair, two chairs together, and two telecasters going nuts, flipping out on this tune, you know, it was and, great. But I'm sorry, it, the video broke up a second. When you did cluster puck, you, you met, you did mail it in though. Is that what you said? Or yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. So they do all the editing once they get all the parts together and put it in place. And of course it's all planned out ahead of time. Like, you play at two minutes and three seconds, and you got you know nine seconds to play it in. Then you stop. Then it's going to be another guy's turn. Then you come back in at three minutes and forty-two seconds and play for eight seconds. You know that kind of. So it's pretty calculated thing. That way, it's easier for them to work with when it's uh, time to mix it all together. You know. 
Sure. But, hey, it got a Grammy, so. Yeah. Wh- whatever, the, whatever the formula was, it, it sounds like it was a, <laughs> a winner. Well, there was enough big shots on there. It probably That oh. probably helped a little bit, too, you know? Absolutely. You know, one thing I like about you is that you seem like the kind of guy that does what you want instead of what, you know, conventional wisdom or what the, the, you know, you take, you don't have a problem taking the road less traveled. And I admire that about you. And that being said, I know I'm kind of the same way. What are the pluses and minuses of that? Well, the pluses are, if you want, you can sleep in your own bed and stay home if you want or not. Uh, the minuses are you miss out on some big shot stuff. And, you know, if, if your 15 minutes of fame means more to you, then you need to take the high road, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of the low one. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if it's low. It's just different. Yeah. Are you working on anything now that you're excited about, Red? Uh... Water pipes breaking out here. <laughs> we had some freezing, so we've got three. One, it is two, cold. Three, what is it? Three, what's the temperature? Water. What's the temperature out there? Oh, right now it's great. It's probably I don't know sixty, fifty-five. Yeah, Indeed, But for the last two weeks, it's been uh, twenty-six to twenty-eight or nine uh, at night. So, which we're not used to here in Central Texas. It's that's murder. You know, I mean, the schools haven't closed. Really, uh, about a month ago, we had four inches of snow just one day. Wow. Uh, so, of course, a bunch of schools closed for that because that's disaster here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, just with the cold weather, a lot of the plumbing out here is is uh, PVC, and I think they use real cheap, thin stuff. So they all, all the plumbing seems to break at the seams where you put two pieces of pipe together. The glue lets go when it freezes. You know, granted, the pipe is uh, 35 years old, too, so yeah. um, that's my excitement around here these days. Yeah, I mean, I'm in Tampa. It's been the same here. It's been in the 30s the last couple of weeks, and it's really frosty. No one here is used to that either. Oh, yeah. It yeah. kills a bunch of plants and things, and it's all the women go nuts. You you grew up in Canada, and your dad was a musician. What was your childhood like? Uh, it was awesome. I mean, like my parents split up when I was a uh, uh, 13 or 14 when I was 14. So I went with my dad and my mom gave me the okay and said, go ahead. That's what you want to do. Cause he was a bit more of a hustler and stayed out late and played cards and shot pool. And there was a gambler and that kind of thing and played a little guitar on the side. So to me, that was great cause he stayed out late and he went and saw bands and that kind of stuff. So to me, I was like, that's what I wanted to do, you know, at 12 years old. So sure. It was awesome for me uh, living that way, and uh, you know he'd have card games in our little apartment or whatever, and, and uh, we lived in kind of a little downtown community with a couple of clubs. So I'd sneak out while they were playing cards, and because they're too noisy, you couldn't sleep anyway. And I'd sneak out and go sit on the curb and buy a nightclub where they had the door open, listen to the band play, and try and steal whatever they're doing, <laughs> listen to the licks, and figure that stuff out, and. By the time I was about 16, of course, then I could get in. The The rule back up there was 21 at the time to get in. So I could go in as long as I was either on the stage or at the doorway outside watching. So eventually I got to know some of the band guys, and they'd, hey, come on, play a couple songs. So I'd get up and play with these some of the bands that were playing, you know, as a kid sitting in with them because I'd heard them enough. I learned some of their tunes note for note, just sitting by the door listening to them. And so I'd get up and play and play it exactly like they were, were doing it. And they all laughed at that thing. Oh, look at this goofball kid he remembers everything, you know? So that's kind of starting out was that kind of thing for me. And my dad was cool with it. Cause he knew I wasn't going to be getting in any trouble. Cause I was such a guitar nut that uh, uh, probably harmless to anything else, you know? Sure. So he was okay with it. So you were like totally groomed for this at an early age and it was your thing and you had the blessing and, and you had the opportunities to take advantage of it or you made the opportunities to take advantage of it. Yeah, I found them, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, uh, my first gigs were, you know, my dad getting me up in the middle of the night when he brought some friends home and said, hey, play for these guys. They want to hear you play. I'm like, oh, okay. 
<laughs> so I'd get up and I'd sit in the chair and I'd play whatever I could play and stumble on different little instrumental things I'd worked on that, you know, cause they were country guys. So then they'd say, Oh gee, we need a guitar player. And that's how I got my first thing was, was we need a guitar player in our band. And there was like a little wedding band that played weekends and, and, uh, I say that I call it the antler circuit because they played the boost <laughs> and the elks and anything with horns on it. The like antler those circuit. Joints, you know? I love so that. they hired me and, and said, we need a guitar player and if you want to play with our band. And I said, well, yeah, I'd be all right. And my dad said, yeah, he'll do it, but you have to come get him and bring him home because he can't drive. Oh, no problem. So they'd do that for a couple of years and, and, I, and they would pay me the same as we make today. <laughs> Back then, yeah, I was making like $40 a night for for a gig. And I was like, holy shit, this is way better than my paper route. I'm yeah. going to quit that, you know. So then I got into playing that way. That's really cool. That's a great story. What are some of the bigger obstacles that you had to overcome throughout this journey, either personally, music-related, or business-related? Uh... Hmm. Obstacles. Hurdles. Just bullshit you had to deal with. Well, I think some of the bullshit stuff was more probably more in Nashville of uh, being a fat guy, you know, that sort of thing. There's a lot of people wouldn't hire you hire me because they're I'm fat and bald and short, so I don't fit in the uh the image. The tall rock guy looking guy yeah so you won't fit in this fancy suit and it won't look good and so i didn't get a bunch of work because of that and and that happened a few times where i went to auditions and and actually the stars would ask me hey you want to come audition we're needing a guitar player and you're great so i'd come audition i wouldn't get the gig several years later a couple of john jorgensen actually uh told me about one you know, he said, oh, it's too bad you never got the gig. And I said, yeah, I always wonder what happened with that. And he told me, he said, yeah, it's because you're too fat. And they didn't think you'd look good in one of their sparkly suits. Wow. So it was that kind of, so I run into a bunch of that kind of stuff. And But, I mean, that said, I don't give a shit one way or another. Sure. I do what I do. And, and way, way, way before that, when I first moved to California, I heard about a gig in San Jose. And I went and auditioned for that gig. And, of course, when I got there, you know, I had a little white j- jacket on there, like a beer jacket or something with a beer logo on the back and a trucker cap. And and I went to this gig and said, I heard you're looking for a guitar player. And the band leader goes, uh, looks at me and he kind of looks with this sort of a surly, eh, yeah, we are. And I said, well, I- I'd sure like to apply for the gig and give it a shot, you know. Well, okay, we'll call you up. And that was, I was there. I got there at seven o'clock. They didn't start till nine and not because I wanted to be extra early, but I thought oh, I'll get there in case any of those guys are there early, not knowing they're old guys. So they show up at five to nine for the gig. You know, <laughs> they're tired of it. They've been there six nights a week for 15 years, probably. So the band leader says, okay, we'll call you up. So they played till two and their last break was at one thirty. So I find out, you know, I went, I went up to them at about 10 o'clock 1030 and on the break and said, Hey, I'm still here. If you want to call me up to play, I'm sure like a shot at it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the last break was at, uh, what did I say? It was one 30. Cause they played till the last one was a half an hour. Last set. So I said, uh, Hey, I'm still here. If you want to get me up, if you don't, that's okay. I can take a hint, you know? So he laughed and, Oh, sorry, man. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so they called me up and I get up and play and, and uh, they're all spinning their heads and going, ooh, I can do pretty good, you know. So the after the second song, the bass player says, you want the job? And I said, uh, let me think about it. <laughs> I was pissed off by then. Sure. At 7 o'clock. That's rude, man. Up. Yeah, that's rude. You know, so, I, you know, it was a really good band, a good steel player. And, and uh, so I said, yeah, yeah, I'll do it, you know, and. About a week later, he comes up to me and he says, you know, I got to apologize. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, when you came in, he said, I thought you're just another truck driver like the rest of our crowd here that comes in and tra- traveling through, you know. And, uh, and I said, well, that's okay. No, nothing wrong with that. He said, well, 
he said, I, you know, I never judge a book by the cover, I guess. But he said, uh, he said, you're probably the best truck driver looking guitar player that we've ever had. <laughs> Kind of is this a weird backhanded compliment? What the hell is that? What does that mean? <laughs> I said thanks, sort of. Sort of, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, how do you he take said, that? I, he says that's all I got. Sorry. So at least he apologized, you yeah. know. But I dealt with that stuff all my life anyway. So that those are kind of things that uh, you know, if I would tell a young guy if he's fat and can play good, well, you better lose weight if you want to get any further, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In the commercial end of the game, you know. Sure. Sure. Since, but I, I don't think I had any any you know bad uh, experiences other than learning people and you know like when I first went to California, I got that gig for a month at this club and so after about a oh four or five days I rented a motel room and thinking I'm going to be there for the month I might as well be real comfortable so I get a little motel room this funky motel and there was a guy across it was a two strip building motel room or motel with several rooms so across the driveway to the other building i hear a guitar playing one day and i go over there and i knock on the door and there's this guy playing in there plays great this old big old fat grumpy guy in there and, and they get talking to him and so I heard great playing man that's awesome and he goes oh do you play and i said yeah a little bit and he says well uh what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm playing over at the saddle horn. He says, oh, really? Who are you with? And I said, oh, I'm playing with this guy. And he says, oh, that son of a bitch. You know, he's a he's a coke dealer, and he, and he uh, raises these fighting cocks, and the cops are on his ass all the time. You know, that guy's nothing but trouble. You shouldn't do that job. I said, well, he's been real nice to me, and no problems. You know, I haven't had any trouble. So I got, you know, and I'm getting to play music. So what's the deal? Oh, he's an asshole, this and that. So wasn't maybe a week goes by, and this guy, the singer, calls me at the motel phone and says, get your shit and get out of there. Of course, he's got a police scanner, too, because of his roosters. <laughs> and he says, uh, the INS, the immigration guys, are on their way to pick you up at the motel, so get out of there now. So I was like, oh, shit, Thanks. He says, I'll meet you at the truck stop down in Cottonwood, you know, 20 miles south, and I'll bring your amp, you know, because I had my guitar with me. So he went to the club, picked up my amp, brought it down there to me to the truck stop, hands me my money for the week. And uh, and I said, well, well, you're in a pickle. You you know, you don't have anybody for, for tonight. He said, oh, it's all right. I already called a buddy of mine. He's going to fill in for you. No worries. Go on. Get out of here, you know. So it was that I run into that kind of stuff about. Wow. And here I'd been going to this guy's room with my guitar and jamming with him for. And, and he was the guy that turned you in. Right. And he's the guy that turned me in. What a piece of shit. Because he hated this other guy. And of course, I brought that up to the singer. I said, hey, do you know this. Uh, uh, oh, I can't remember his name. Lucky was his first name. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, and he says, oh, yeah, he's just a hateful old bastard, and he's just jealous, and I won't use him, so he hates my ass. Uh, blah, blah. So, yeah, he turned me in, and, and I'd been going over to his place and jamming with him and hanging out, and he was putting on a real good front of, oh, this is great. Thanks for coming over, and, boy, it's sure good to play with somebody who knows how to play and all this stuff, and then he turns around and turns me in. I don't get that. So, well, I mean, I don't get it either, but yeah. by the same token, that was my first, holy shit, I could go to jail <laughs> kind of deal because I didn't have any any papers. I was just visiting, so I was yeah. totally legal, and this guy knew that. And, you know, so right then and there, I learned to shut the hell up about yeah, stuff. right, you know, right. And stand back and sit in the corner from there on, walk into a building, find a spot against the wall, facing the door you need to run out of you know <laughs> looking at that kind of looking at life like that which is sad i think for a young guy to have to do that yes by the same token if you don't want to get your ass in a sling then you need to learn some of those skills so you know through those kind of things and i had a bunch of stuff like that go on and uh, through the years and and that's how I, I learned a bunch of that so those are i guess technically negatives yeah uh, but in a way, they turned out positive because I learned from that. And now I can pass that information on to some young guys 
that I teach and that I meet that I like that I think might get it. Sure. You know, there's a bunch of that kind of just life thing. Life you know? shit. Yeah, yeah. I know it's unpleasant stuff you have to deal with that during your trip through life. I know it's it's right. and it just happened that the guitar is dragging me through life for me, but you know, those kind of things can happen to anybody that owns a welder. It doesn't matter shit what you do, yeah. you know. Yeah, for sure, man. Wow, but that's an unpleasant thing. Um everybody we all pay tuition in our careers and i was wondering if you'd be kind enough to maybe share one or two mistakes you made if you made them along your journey and 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 the lessons you learned from these mistakes and oh, i guess this could be one of them of of you know probably being too naive or too too uh comfortable probably well i think i'm perfect <laughs> Where, let me get your wife. <laughs> Where's your wife? Let's let's valid let's valid <laughs> let's validate this. Let's, I know the fastest way to get to the bottom of this. <laughs> Somebody's got to work. <laughs> I can say that. I don't know. It's uh, regrets. You mean like or or well, just uh, it, was there any any things you did? Like for example, a lot of times. Not a lot of times. Some of the stories like I've heard, if I've asked that question, is number one uh, that comes to mind is I, and this is probably not your story at all, but I was uh, ill. I was underprepared for a gig. I was too cocky at the time. I and I, and as a result, I lost it. And believe me, I never did that again. That kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I I could say that I don't think I lost any gigs. But I've had guys give me shit because of that, you know, where, uh, like a band leader would say, well, you just don't give a shit about nothing. You just, you fucking know it all. And you're, you know, you're real cocky about it and you just don't give a shit about nothing. So you do what you want. And I'm, and my argument is, well, cause I can, <laughs> and, you know, that, and that to me, that's a young cocky guy way yeah, of thinking, sure. which is an asshole, obviously now thinking of that well, yeah, so yeah those are wrong things that maybe i did some stuff like that where somebody got in my ass about something and i bowed up and said fuck you it's because you can't play and i can play better than all of you fuckers you know that kind of but that's 17 years old walking around with a heart on on a mission yeah. you know i mean that all the young guys do that thinking they know everything sure and it's, you know as soon as my dad died, I found out I don't know nothing, and I sure wish he was here to help me, and and uh, you know that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I sure do. I sure do, man. At that point, you think you know everything, and nobody can tell you nothing. And I mean, my dad even said it at one point. He said, "Well, if you're so fucking smart and you already know everything, why are you living here?" You know. And I said, "Free rent." <laughs> Wow, that's when the lights went out. That yeah, was it. That was you probably know, not a good, uh, not a good thing to say to your dad at that point. Good response. Teacher, yeah. Talk. So that was it. The lights went out, and I woke up, and I never said that again. Yeah. You know, I mean those kind of things. But uh, I think those are more life things than they are musical uh, regrets. Yeah. I don't have any musical regrets because I've learned from every situation I've ever been in. I've been in a bunch of bands that I didn't care for that weren't fun. And I needed the money at the time, just like a like a hungry actress that does the naked photos. You know, it's like, well, you're hungry. You got to work. You got to eat. You got, you know, so I did a lot of gigs that I maybe wasn't proud of that I was be a part of because they were too schmaltzy or they weren't guitar oriented or, or guitar kind of gig. Uh, but they're work. So to me, it's like at the time I might've been embarrassed and which is wrong to think that way sure. because now I look like, shut up. It's work. Yeah. You got to make a living, you know, exactly. Yeah. You can't, you know, you can't, uh, enjoy the plumbing unless you got to fix it once in a while, you know, <laughs> that kind of same kind of deal. You got to work for what you get. So in that way, I, I don't have any regrets about it, Sure, but I think it was young, dumb, stupid thinking. Yeah. So if that's something to pass on to a young guy and say, well, don't be so cocky about how great you are or how knowledgeable you are or whatever it is that you think you have better than everybody else, uh, that's a bad thing. But all young guys go through that. Uh, it doesn't matter what they're doing, though. You know, if they're a ball player, they're, if they're 18, they're going to think they're the best on the planet. 
you know, and that's like getting in a, in a ring with a man, you know, it's a boy and a man. It's a different story. Mm. You know, if, if a 20 year old gets in a, in a ring with a 35 year old, he's going to get his ass handed to him. Yeah. It's going to happen. It's, there's no getting out of that. You know, that it's those kind of things, but that's just a young guy thinking, Oh, I'm young and fit and tough and I can take this old guy. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so Probably not. Amazing. Isn't it amazing how different you think as you get older and how you are able to look back and realize how silly some of the thoughts you had were? Oh, of course. You know, like just looking at those kinds of things. It's yeah. Like when I lived in Nashville, the owner of this club down on Broadway, he owned a boxing school up above the Roberts. And uh, Robert Moore was his name. And there was chairs out in front of the club on Broadway Street. And the guys would sit out there some of the bouncers and friends and people passing by, about six chairs, and they'd sit out there. Well, they threw a guy out of there one afternoon uh, while we were playing, and we took a break, and here comes this guy with a big axe, a big three-foot axe, coming back to the club. Holy crap. Robert. So Robert gets out in the middle of the street. Luckily, it was, you know, 4 in the afternoon, 4.30, nobody, no, no traffic. And it was early on in the when the Broadway was going on, so it wasn't real packed. So uh, he gets out on the street with this guy, and he sees him coming out, coming across the street with him, and there's somebody else runs out at him. So he takes a swing at that guy with the axe, and the guy runs out of the way. So Robert heads back to the club. He grabs a chair from the front of the club, takes a chair out there, and he holds it up like he's backing off a lion. And the guy's coming <laughs> at him with the axe. He swings, the, holds the axe up like he's going to throw it. Robert throws the chair at him, knocks the guy down with the chair. And I was like, there's, there's a prime example of a young, young, dumb guy with an axe thinking he's going to come and cut the head off of this club owner. Right, right. He doesn't know that he's a boxer that hits like a mule. If he ever hit him, the guy'd be dead. He could stop his heart with one punch in the chest. You know, he doesn't know that. But yet, Robert picks a chair up, throws it at the guy, disarms him, then grabs him, puts him in a headlock, and makes him pass out. Calls the cops and they come and get him and on it on it goes. But there's to me that's a classic young, stupid, dumb shit thing for that guy to do. And here he's coming on a up on a, a guy granted he was probably sixty two years old at that point, Robert was. But wow. lots of seasoning, lots of miles, boxing pro, golden gloves guy, had a school. Not that that's anything, but just a wise guy that had a bunch more knowledge. You know, granted, a guy brought an axe to a chair fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty country right there, you know? Wow. Hey, Rick. So those are things that you learn, I think, and like a guy like that knows a bunch of, of common sense things to to ward off bullshit, you know? Absolutely. All right. Let's talk gear for just a little bit. I, I really can't even hang with you when it comes to gear, talking about gear. But what what's your go-to guitar right now? And maybe what other two guitars of yours would round out your top three? Uh, the top three, I'd say my first one is a 52 Telecaster that I have. Um, it's kind of been my main dog for about five or six years. I got it. I want to say I got it five or maybe six years ago now, or this summer will be six years. Uh, it's a 1952 that Fender refinished in 1958. What does that mean? What do you mean by that? Well, a guy bought a guitar of Telecaster in 52, and either he sold it or he took, sent it. I think it was the original, excuse me, the original owner sent that guitar back to Fender in 1958 to have it refinished because it was chipped up and the paint was all wore off the fingerboard and all of that. Wow. So Fender took it all apart, repainted it and sent it back to him. So normally in the vintage world, a 52 Telecaster in, in really good shape with the original or real bad shape with the original paint brings a certain amount of money. If the thing is refinished by somebody that does good work, it's worth half because it's refinished. Now, Fender refinished it. It's worth a bit more. And on this particular guitar, it was refinished in 1958. So that makes it, like, super rare and cool. Very. Because they did some, obviously, but not a lot. 
So in a way, at the least, it's worth what a 58 Telecaster is worth because it was refinished by them and you know in 58. Sure. But it is 52 guitar. So it's a real cool guitar that way. So I had it refretted, and I've been playing the hell out of it. It's an awesome guitar. And, uh, it's, it's a Sunburst, uh, which they didn't do on Telecasters until 59 when they made the custom ones with the binding. Uh, so most Telecasters were, most all of them, probably 95% of them were blonde that turned yellow at some some point, you know. So this was one of those butterscotch ones that they redid in the Sunburst. And if you look at any 58 Stratocaster and my guitar, it's exactly the same tint and shade. And there's marks from Fender that say that Fender did the work That's underneath the guard and on the bottom of the neck. They put a stamp that indents in the wood and paint over it. That's great. So it's a mark that they that they did that work back then, and they did it all up until the seventies with this series of numbers. So it's all in that way. It's you know, like I say, a totally a fifty-two guitar, but repainted in fifty-eight by Fender. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. Off there. That said, it's an awesome guitar anyway. So I had to have it. Uh, when I got it, and it's just been a wonderful guitar. How did you Once get I got it? a refresh, it, it was way, way better. You know. How'd you come across that? A friend of mine's a vintage dealer out in uh, uh, Berkeley, California, hmm. and uh, <clears throat> he called me up. He said, "I know you like Telecasters with big necks." He's, "I got an oddball here. I think you'll like it, though." So I said, "Well, what is it?" And he told me all that stuff, and so he came out to Dallas. They have a vintage guitar show every. Uh, may in dallas so he came out for that and it's where a bunch of dealers get together and sell vintage guitars and it's like literally thousands of guitars from vintage dealers from all over the country or the world that come to this dallas international guitar show and it's uh they do it at the uh nolan ryan ballpark so it's in a great big huge arena so there's probably 350 booths wow and, and each booth is one or two of those long uh banquet tables and they have guitars on the tables behind in that booth and each booth is represented by a, a music store one from des moines one from new jersey one from california so there's a you know probably 350 different dealers with their best stuff for sale so anyway he brought it out to that i play at that every year and uh he brought that out with his the rest of his stuff to show me and see if I liked it. So, of course, I was like, ah, I'll give you everything else I got just to get it. <laughs> <laughs> and and like, you probably had to. Yeah, I had to do a bunch of horse trading to get it. But I got it, and it's an awesome guitar. And then I have an old Stratocaster that's uh, to me, is the best Stratocaster I've ever had or played. Or Sound-wise, it's just unbelievable. Tell me about and that guitar. 55. 55? 55, yeah. Wow. Real old. And then uh, I'd say my third favorite would be an Epiphone Sheraton. Really? And that's like uh, Epiphone's version of a Gibson 335. Yeah, yeah. What what year is that guitar? That's a 62. So it has the mini humbuckers on it, not the big ones like, hmm. a, like Gibson. Uh, they're mini humbuckers. <laughs> Like on the Sus Pauls, hmm. the Deluxes. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but that's the two of those pickups. So it's a 335, really, with the smaller humbuckers. I've heard so many times that the older, because I had an Epiphone, but it was a newer one, like three or four years ago, two years ago. And man, yeah. it sounded okay, but it just felt like garbage. But I've yeah. heard that these older ones are just tremendous. Yeah. If, to me, if you're looking for vintage guitars for yourself, I would look for like an Epiphone, like instead of a, if you wanted a 62, 335, you know, you'd have to pay $14,000 for that guitar. Uh, if you want a 62 Epiphone Sheridan, you could get it for eight. Yeah. You know, it's still a lot of money. It's still a lot of money. Yeah. That said, it's a holy shit guitar still and better than anything new, any custom shop, whatever. Hmm. All the new stuff to me. The paint is way too thick, so none of them ring. They have no good vibrations. They're real dead. You just hit them, and they go thunk. That's it. There's no no life to them. 
where all any old guitar, if you just go to a vintage show and pick up old guitars and strum an E chord, you'll feel that vibration that you do not get on any new guitars. There's nothing new that has that. Nothing. For Gibson think, and Fender, in your opinion? Oh, everything. Martins, everything. Gills, mm. all of them. Because I think the, they use nitrocellulose lacquer. They don't use the polymer paints that that sink in and, and evaporate. Where the old ones, that old nitrocellulose lacquer, it soaks into the wood, and they didn't put as many coats on it because they were cheap. Mm. So they soak in, so the wood breathes more. When the when the lacquer cracks and get all the checks in it, then the air can let the moisture come out of that wood. The wood dries out. The guitar eventually gets a bit lighter, rings better, vibrates better because the wood is more porous without any moisture in it. What would Eric Johnson say about that? Would he agree? Uh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> <Get her digging. laughs> What's the difference between a 52 and a 53, Telly? Isn't the 53, was that the one where they had the, the, spe- the, the special wine? There was somebody there? No. They're... <laughs> They're all they're all top guitars from back then. Uh, I mean, there's there's Wednesday guitars and Friday guitars too. What's that? You know, like a car that's built on a Friday oh, yeah. <laughs> at four four forty five is probably going to have a few little repairs needed. You know? Yeah, I get where you. Uh, Wednesday guitars like ah middle hump day, middle of the week, still got to keep going right. and do it right. You know? So there's good ones and there's bad ones and everything, but I think that. 53 got the glory because of, you know, Jeff Beck, Roy Buchanan, Danny Gatton, a bunch of guys happened to play 53s, so they've kind of become the holy grail of the telecast. Okay, okay. But I think, you know, what they call the black guards are the ones with the black Bakelite pick guard. They were made until 55, you know, so they're, or mid-54 actually. But so everything with a black guard is a certain era. Okay. So you have a 51 to a 54. There's good ones and bad ones in every one of those years. There's lots of bad 53s too. Sure. I mean, I've had not hundreds, but I've probably had a hundred of those old guitars in my time. Wow. You know, through the years. Cause I've been, that's what I, I had been since I was a teenager, been wheeling and dealing in the vintage thing and horse trading and restoring. And that's kind of been my extra side thing for extra money. Hmm. So all through my travels until eBay, I used to pawn shop daily and music store and find stuff that maybe they did thought, oh, we want seven hundred for this, and I go, oh, that's worth two grand. I'll buy it. Okay, you know, gotcha. And I'll flip it, or it would be a '53 Telecaster with um, maybe the pick guard was gone and a different machine heads and one pickup changed. So that guitar is worth half of what a mint one's worth. So I would get that, and back when I was a teenager, I used to repair guitars for guys. So I got a lot of 50s guitars back then that guys would say, oh, I got this new DiMarzio pickups. Would you put them in? I'd say, are you sure? Yeah. Well, i got to have them. And would you put this brass bridge on my Stratocaster, and would you put a change of this and that? And Okay. Well, what are you going to do with your old parts? Fuck, I don't know. Throw them away. No. Uh, okay, I'll trade you my labor for your parts. So I wound up with boxes of good old parts. Wow. So I would save that stuff, and then I would get a guitar that was missing this or that, rifle through my stuff. The black pick guard, just sake of argument, from 51 till 54 is the same guard. They're not dated, and they're not marked, and so they were used the same material, the same everything, for those four years. Wow, <laughs> my, that's awesome. So if I had a guitar that was missing that, I would have two or three of those. Now, this one's not as beat up. It would look more original on this guitar, like it would match more than the more beat up one. So I'd put it on. Now the guitar is back to period correct, not the way it came from the factory, but what they call period correct. All the parts are put back from that period. So that still makes it a real collectible guitar. Then I could sell that guitar for premium price. Wow. So you're a hustler, man. I really, I like that. I like that about you. Do you. I've done that pretty much my whole uh, adult life as far as from when I was probably 17 on uh, until, like I say, eBay cut a hole in that because all the pawn shop guys can go 53 Telecaster on the keyboard, find out, oh, Grun Guitars sold it for this. Holy shit. 
well, we'll ask half again as much. So you yeah. want to stop, and you see a 75 Stratocaster, and you go, oh, that's pretty cool. You look at that, and they go, oh, well, they want, you know, they want 2200 bucks for it. Well, it's only worth twelve. You know, yeah. so a bunch of that's gone away in the, in the vintage world. But prior to that, that stuff, I used to go to laundromats, and you remember uh, in the old days, the laundromats had a bulletin board, yeah, yeah, yeah. a little piece of paper with a phone number. Yeah. I bought 63 Stratocaster, I bought a blonde Fender Showman, a 52 Martin, a bunch of that stuff up in Canada uh, when I was like 19 or 20, a ton of that stuff. Just walking around and looking for those opportunities in places play, like laundromats. Look, yeah, I play in these little towns and I'd get their little green sheet, the whatever, you know, Craigslist thing back in the day. Sure. Uh, go to the laundromats, look, guitar for sale. What is it? Oh, I don't know. Well, do you have it handy? on the phone uh yeah can you look inside the case okay it's a black case or a brown one? Oh, it's a brown case okay does it have pink lining yeah it does okay so it's a gibson okay uh, it says gibson on the head can you look in the hole is there any numbers give me the numbers i'd look in my books or i would have notes that i made of serial numbers and things back in those days before the internet sure i'd look that up and go oh it's a 1952 gibson j45 you know <laughs> What do you want for it? Oh, we want seven hundred dollars for it. Eh, it's worth twelve. Okay, I'll come over and look at it. So I come look at it. I beat them out of it for five. Sure. I flip it for a grand real quick. I double my money. Yeah, yeah, that's so awesome, I man. A little float to keep buying guitars and put my use. I've used since used up all my vintage parts over the you know lot last twenty years, uh, putting stuff back and flipping it and getting money, and then I can buy property with that. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, do you know Greg Martin from the yes. Kentucky Headhunters? I think yeah. he just got a 53. Tally? Tally Caster. Yeah, and, and I asked him, I said, what's the difference? And he, he that's why I got that from He said in 53, there's a guy, I don't remember the guy's name, but all these pickups were, it was a Spanish guy. Oh, Abigail uh, Ibera. No, 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 it wasn't her. Uh, Paul. Paul Ho, P A Paulio, something like that. But it was they were all all wound. Well, the, no, no, no. The next, it was the next. It's a sp- oh, it's, Tadio Gomez. Yes, yeah, it was a it, yeah, Paul, Tadio, yeah, Gomez. But, that's it. But he also he worked for Fender. Uh, he made necks from 1951 until 55 or six. Okay, so they're all the same again. The same, yeah. Right, but he didn't do all the necks. Yeah, he was one of the guys. They had three neck carvers. No, he. But Greg got the one. You know, you look at it and it has the guy's name on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mine, my fifty two says Tadio G. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing. Okay, same thing. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's why. That's why he got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So one of those those uh, guys that say that a lot of guys, vintage guys, think that he was the best neck carver. Right. So if you have one that has his name on it, that's a better guitar. Right. You know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. Right. That's yeah. like. You know, I think some of that's got blown out of proportion because a, guy, a bunch of guys have found 53s with his name on it and went, oh, 53 is the one. You know? Okay. I gotcha. 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 Yeah. Um, any cool stories behind how you acquired any of your guitars? Uh, well, that 52, I told you yes. how I got it. Uh, yeah. The Stratocaster. No, I mean, I, I just, I ended up horrible. Trading a bunch of vintage stuff to get it, uh, but I had a '58 Stratocaster when I was 12 or 13. That my dad, I saved up my paper route money, and I was going to go buy a new Stratocaster down in Washington State. I was in Vancouver. Of course, it was cheaper in the states, and uh, there was a brand new black '73. Was in '73, I think, or four. Uh, Stratocaster was a three bolt neck, but to me it was like that's Richie Blackmore's guitar. I got to have one just like it because yeah. he has a black one, and I could play like him if I have that dad. <laughs> so, well, son, save up your money. So I had my three hundred and ten dollars to buy that guitar. So we get down there, we go to Joe's Joe's, Joe's Music in Linwoods, which is just out of Seattle, and there's that black guitar hanging there, three hundred and ten dollars with the case. It's like let's get it. And my dad goes. Eh, let's go pawn shopping. Maybe we can find a used one, save you some money. And I'm like, 
uh, Dad, come on. It'll be gone the time we come back. Some other kid's going to get it, you know? And he's like, nah, I think we should go downtown. So we went downtown. Of course, he knew where all the pawn shops were on this one street. So we went pawn shop, and he said, you go down this side, I'll go down the other side. If you see something that's, you know, just go in there and ask them if they have any used Stratocasters. And if you, if you see one, come out in the street and whistle, I'll come up. Vice versa. If you hear my whistle, come see me. All right. So I wasn't looking, but I went and asked anyway because I, I wanted that new one because nobody else had played it. It was shiny and all that. So I get to the second last store on my side of the street. I said, hey, have you got any... Uh, Fender Stratocasters and this old guy's, yeah, I think we might. And he says, hey, give me up in the loft of the pawn shop. Is there a Fender Stratocaster up there? I think it's in a brown case. And uh, the guy is the son. And he says, yeah, there is one here, Dad. So he brings his case down. Of course, it's a brown fake alligator case, cheap harmony. <laughs> American made, but a cardboard case. And I'm like, oh, God. So they bring it down and that open the case. And there is the Layla guitar, the wow. one that's on, of the Layla album. It looks just like it. Of course, it's not that guitar, but it's a 58 strap, worn neck, chipped up, broken pick guard. And just then my dad walks in. I was closing the case going, okay, thanks. Cause I was going to keep going, going to get the black one, you know, just then my dad walks in he goes, what's that? I said, ah, it's a, it's a Stratocaster, but it's really beat up. And he goes, Oh, let's look at it. And then opens a case. And so picks it up. It's not bad weight. Looks good. Pick guards broke dad. Ah, oh, you can glue that back. He's looking at it. So look at the neck. It's all beat up. And the paint's all chipped and cracked. It looks really old. And he says, yeah, well, you could repaint it if you had to, you know. He said, well, I want that black one. He said, you can make this black. <laughs> and the guy says, 90 bucks. And my dad says, you take Canadian money? He said, hell yeah. So he says, 90 bucks Canadian. Okay. So he buys it, you know. And I'm just like, oh, fuck. This is the worst day of my life. <laughs> I got a 58 strat worst day of my life. Funny how you think, right? Well, I'm... 13 years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That black one I is already, it. I would be Richie Blackmore if I had that guitar. Of course. You know, so I was so bummed. I'm sitting in the back seat playing it all the way home, three hour drive to back home, and kind of whining and, you know, sure beat up. Pick guard is broke. How do you fix that? And he said, ah, you can glue it. It's plastic. It'll glue. And I said, yeah, but I want that black one. He said, well, if Play it for a while like it is. Leave it alone. Don't fuck with it, he says. He said, uh, leave it alone for a while. And, you know, if you want to paint it, uh, your Uncle Vic, a buddy of his, had a body shop. And they painted cars back then still with lacquer. <laughs> he said, he can paint it for you if you have to get it painted. So I was like, uh, I was still bummed. So I get home, of course, about a month later, I'm wearing them out about painting it black. Well, I'll call your Uncle Vic and see what he says. So I call him up, and he said, he'll take all the pieces off of it and uh, strip it down to bare wood. Just sand it lightly. Don't go too far. Just use like 250 and take all the color off of it. I'll paint it for you. I said, okay. So he did, and he painted it black. So instantly it's worth half, so it's $45 at that point. <laughs> but the vintage, I don't think the vintage thing was barely going then, so kind of didn't matter, and I didn't care at that age. Sure. So I had that guitar for probably seven years, and then I traded it to one of the kids in school. Uh, he wanted it really bad because he was a Rory Gallagher fan. So he wanted it really bad. And I said, well, if you buy me that Gibson Firebird over at the music store in Keynote Music in Wally, it's a little town, neighbor town, if you buy that Firebird, I'll trade you. And it was like 400 bucks So back in those days. So he bought it, and I traded him. Oh, wow. So he had my for probably 15 years so i'd moved away to alberta and was doing the pawn shop and wheel and dealing missing that guitar of course my dad died by then so i called him up and got his number from my brother because he lived close and called him give him my sob story i want the guitar back i'd sure love to have it he said well if you give me something that's uh sunburst with a rosewood fingerboard i'll trade you 
So I had a 63 that I bought from the laundromat deal. <laughs> really clean shape. So I shipped it to him and he shipped me my old one back. So I got the old one back and I had it uh, until about, uh, probably till about six years ago. And by then I know more about guitars and everything. And it turned out the neck had been shaved in the back and was a lot thinner than it was originally. So it never really felt that great. When I was a kid, it was great, of mm. course. But now it was like, nah, probably not so much. So I had a guy that does refinishing work. Uh, his name's Tom Murphy, that worked for Gibson for a long time. And his he's one of the first guys to do what they call relic finishing, where they redo it, but then they chip it up and make it look like it was originally old. So he put the body back to the sunburst because I had pictures of it. So he matched it up, looked exactly like it did when I got it, put it back to the original finish. So I played it for a while. I was like, nah, it just doesn't have it, you know. So I ended up selling it and using it as part of the trade on this 55. On the, oh, good for so you, man. Story to get <laughs> yeah. 30 years later, I traded in on this uh, 55 that I got, you know. Funny how that you can't, you know, you can never connect the dots moving forward. But when you look back at it, it's pretty interesting how these things all fall into place. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's like, wow, how does that work? I know. It's really cool. Um, I, Most performers most players are always trying to grow as a player you know trying to stretch out and do new things and i know is committed to your craft as you are you're no different how would you say maybe over the last five or plus years or so your playing may have changed well hopefully i think it's got better and more accurate more precise my timing is better my phrasing is better because of my timing uh because i focus on that non-stop and to me, that's such a huge part of music, uh, especially creating your own. If you, if I get to play a solo on one of your songs, I, now I think about the song, the lyrics of the song, what you're meaning when you wrote that song, and what what you're what you're wanting to get across. Whereas when I was seventeen or twenty, I'd be like, "Hey, listen to what I just learned," and I would play that over your heartfelt, broken heart song not thinking or being aware that you had something else in mind, I'm shoving down your throat. What I think is a cool thing where now I don't look at it like that. And, and some guys get that early and some guys never get it ever hmm. that are 50, 60 and still overplaying and playing the wrong stuff on all everything, you know? So hopefully I've learned a bunch of that kind of stuff of, uh, being aware of, the guy that you're working for, you know, not only he's paying the bill, but he wrote the song. He had a purpose. He wrote the song because his, his heart was broke or his truck fell apart or whatever the song is about. So you want to play accordingly. So if he, like if he wrote the song thinking he was going to be James Taylor singing it, well then whatever's on James Taylor's records, you should play kind of that feel or that vibe to give that guy what he wants, even though he doesn't know that that's what he's doing. Hopefully my musical experience tells me, oh, this guy wrote this song and he's trying to make it sound kind of like a James Taylor tune. So if I treat it like that, I bet you he'll be pretty happy with the results because he maybe he doesn't know that he's a real big James Taylor fan and he ripped off half of the song from the James Taylor tune. So if I play that vibe, then he's... He's going to go, man, that turned out just hot. Makes mm. that guy happy. To me, that's the goal now more than, hey, Mr. Songwriter, listen to this hot shit you can do and I can't, or you can't and I can't. Yeah, yeah. And let, playing like that. So I think I've learned a bunch of that kind of stuff that's helped me to be a better player as well as working on my own shit, which is my timing and my phrasing and playing in tune and and uh, as a player, learning more stuff that I can have more tools in my toolbox to utilize on different varieties of stuff. So I'm not so much of a one horse pony. Sure. You know, or one trick. It's so great. Uh, one of the things that is so cool as I'm talking, your enthusiasm, man, for for this is just so like, boom it's just it's, it's so powerful and you've been doing it so long and it's like really enjoyable to hear that that 
you know, you're, you're probably as enthusiastic today. I didn't know you, obviously, when you were that 13-year-old kid. But when you went to go pick up that black Strat, you have that same level of enthusiasm now, man. That's really awesome to, to – Oh, yeah. To me, I'm still just as eat up as I was when I was a kid, you know. Mm, for sure, man. Uh, if I asked you to pick your three top three Desert Island discs – but well, they don't call them discs anymore. Desert Island downloads. <laughs> <laughs> if I said disc, it's like automatically you're old. <laughs> uh, what would be the first three CDs that come to mind? No particular order, and bearing in mind that this could change tomorrow. Well, now that now that you can get box sets, <laughs> <laughs> it would be a Jimmy Bryant box set, uh, Merle Haggard's early box set. Not stuff I played on, the early stuff. Uh, and for the third one, I would say if it came with everything, Chet Atkins, all of his stuff. <laughs> mm. All right. That's some good. Uh... But they'd have to be box sets, right? I couldn't do it. That's right. Hey. Um to me, that stuff's so good. One CD is not One enough. CD is not. I hear you, man. I hear you. <laughs> For me, anyway. Somebody else might go, ah, that's old people's music. No, you're smart. You know what? You're the first person to say, I want the box set. That's good. That's like that's like the you know the genie and the the, the three wishes. Yeah. You know, he's like, no, I don't want a house. I want you. Know, I don't. Yeah. You know, I want a neighborhood or something. You know, something like that. You know, okay, no problem. It's your wish. Boom. Yeah, it's like the three guys on the genie wish. There. Yeah, I want a big hole. The second guy, fill it with Frenchmen. <laughs> the third guy, fill it with water. <laughs> That's oh, Canadian there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I gathered when you said the Frenchman. That yeah. went over my head a bit. Uh, Red, what's something you've learned about yourself along this fun and interesting journey you've been on? That I'm still a dumbass and I don't know half of what I thought I did. Still a dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i wish my dad was here to correct me <laughs> well that's nice man that's really nice to hear that you've talked really fondly about your dad which is uh really nice to hear uh i had a question anyone you consider to be your hero i'm assuming your answer would be your dad my dad yeah that's great best childhood memory uh riding my bike when I was a kid, that's all I did was ride a bike until I got a guitar. That's nice. I was on that thing as much as I could. I finished school, I'd get on that bike, and I'd be gone until dark. Supper, forget it. I was a skinny kid back then. <laughs> <laughs> did you grow up in a rural area, or were you in the city? Uh, rural, I guess it would be. Uh, neighborhood, I mean... Um, I think each na each person on our on our neighborhood had uh you know 5 acres, 2 acres, 1 acre. Oh yeah, that's rural. Yeah. So pretty pretty rural, but still the streets, you know, where's all avenues numbered. Yeah. We were on 84th Avenue and you know and it was uh oh probably I want to say to elementary school, the first school it was probably a mile and a half. Oh, wow. That's so we'd walk that in the winter and ride our bikes the rest of the time, you know. Holy. So where, okay, you grew up in Alberta, you said? No, uh, grew in up British, in Vancouver. Vancouver. Is that on the east or the west side of, of Canada? Sorry, I'm American. You know, we don't know anything about. Vancouver's on the west coast. Okay. So that's a mile yeah. and a half. You're freezing. Oh, yeah. But, of course, Canadian kids, you wear a white T-shirt and a blue denim jacket. <laughs> wow. So your, and your basket masters we had, which is your converse here. <laughs> oh, okay. I never heard of that basket masters. Interesting. That might have been the Canadian version of them. Yeah. Tell and, me of course, you know, the roads in the wintertime, we had, you know, we'd have two, three inches of snow out there in the wintertime, and, and – uh, so if you caught a Volkswagen, you could hook on the bumper and bumper ski to, to school. There you go. Yeah. That Did that was... hot in the winter, you know. That's nice. But other than that, boy, it was on that bike. I just lived on my bicycle and loved it. 
Tell me something about yourself people would either be surprised to hear or would find a little odd. Hmm. <laughs> Probably everything's odd. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine because <laughs> I've heard the word freak quite a few times in my life. So I guess that's pretty much <laughs> that's pretty odd right there. I you guess. really I, freakish player, I would say. But well, yeah, I mean, just you're a freak because that's all you do is guitar and you remember everything. And you're, you know, I've been called uh, what's that guy, Rain Man. I've been called that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because guys will say, hey, do you know the solo from. 25 or 6 to 4. Do you know the solo from uh, Stairway to Heaven, the middle? Yeah, I know it. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, see, I remember lots of stuff and a lot of bits and pieces from all kinds of things. So mm -hmm. I get called that. So I guess that's kind of weird and odd. You know, that kind of. Uh, but by the same token, anybody that knows me knows I've been that way since I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I remember bicycle parts and things like that, you know. Oh yeah, your memory is awesome, man. I could tell right I mean, early on in this conversation, like I said, when a guy is so precise as you are, mm -hmm. that's when you know someone's got a real good memory cuz you'll say something like, "Well, the the gig started at 2:45 and went to, you didn't say, you know, started in the afternoon and went to that precision, man. That's a good memory. It's always a trigger." Well, I don't know if I have anything that like I say that would be surprising you know, anybody that knows me, it knows it's pretty out there yeah. what, what I am. And sure. All I, it's a, music and guitars and, you know, and and I'm a bit of a MacGyver. I mean, I, I, uh, anybody I know says, man, you know, even in Nashville, it's like, man, can't get it fixed, take it to red. You know, that kind of. You're the guy. I'm a fix-it kind of MacGyver duct tape and coat hangers, kind of see three things in a teaspoon to make out of it, you know. Thank you. My wife just bought me some coffee. Awesome. Tell her I like mine with cream. Red wants one with cream. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> most important person in your life? Well, I'd say my dad until he passed, and now it's my wife. And congrats again on that. What's the most important thing your dad taught you? How to pay attention. Wow, that is a skill that is long gone now, I think. <laughs> Tell me about it. How to pay attention. I yeah. think that is so, unfortunately, probably so unimportant. Like if you had a headline that said how to pay attention, I don't think anybody would pay attention to it. No, of course not. <laughs> like, no, it's me, 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 me. It's all I got in my little world right now. That's all that matters. Man, it's this. This yeah, looking stuff. at your phone. It's the, how, it's the phone, man. How about looking where you're going to land when you trip with that fucking thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we do sound like a couple of old guys saying this, but yeah, yeah, I agree with you, man. I mean, he, my dad was a wonderful snooker player, so he was always thinking ahead like that. He said, think ahead when you're playing music. He said, you know what you're going to play, so play what you're going to play, but think ahead. Where's the chords going next? Think ahead of that. You know, it's like shooting pool. He said, when you make a, when you think, oh, I'm going to get that ball and I'm going to shoot it in that hole, that's okay. But where's the white one going to land after that? Yeah. Is it going to help the other guy or is it going to help you? Sounds like your dad had a lot of street smarts and that he imparted that's a lot of that to you. That's what he was. He, yeah. he was a hustler at the main game, the guitar, because he was, you know, it looks like a fun thing. So he bought a guitar and, started jacking with it and pretty soon he was playing because he was a smart guy. So it didn't take him long to figure shit out and he yeah. had a good enough ear, I guess. And he played good. You know, mm -hmm. I thought, I think now back when he played, it was, was really good stuff. And I mean, it wasn't magic kind of holy shit, uh, Freddie King or nothing. Mm -hmm. Loved the blues. And, you know, so he played a little bit of blues guitar and a little bit of country stuff and was into that. But he was, a, I mean, as he did anything he could do, he was a longshoreman. Uh, he made drywall for a long time, uh, so he wasn't afraid of work. Yeah, yeah. But he was also a hustler. He played pool, shot pool for a living, and uh, played poker and card games, and was into that kind of stuff. And wheeler dealer, and just a hustler kind of guy. So sure. 
he had tons of street smarts. Yeah. I think it's important to have that, man. It, it's a great – it helps you with people tremendously, I think, when you have that. It helped me to get started on how to read people because yeah. he would tell me, that guy there is one of those. This guy there, he's one of those. Watch yeah. out for that kind of person. Yeah. And not, you know, and I thought at the time, boy, that's kind of negative, Dad. Now I think being an old guy, I guess I'm a negative old fucker like he was, you know. But to well, look at it, it's important to know who you're dealing with. I mean, whether they're good or bad, and it's just as important to know, like, oh, this guy's a really kind person. Of course, you know. Sure. It's, it's, so maybe if he said something, it's not out of malice. It's it, it, his because oh, he's no. a gen, you know, he's a genuine guy, and you know, he's doesn't understand or whatever, you know. So I think it's important to be. Yeah, it's the difference in a guy walks to you on the street and goes, "Excuse me, could you help me, please?" Why, sure. sure what do you, yeah, yeah. you know? Or if a guy goes, "Hey, have I got a deal for you?" Right, right, right. Don't, Don't turn around. <laughs> yeah, man. Hold, hang on to your wallet. Yeah, you better be wearing a metal pie plate, you know. Mm. What's the most important thing your mom taught you? Uh, be yourself and go with your heart. And that you have. Best money you've ever spent on something. Tools. What kind of tools? For guitar or for... Any. Just tools uh, in general. Just tools like... Uh, yeah, wrenches and saws and things like that because, uh, you know, to me, um, growing up a broke guitar player, you learned your necessities, the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. So you learn how to fix all your shit by yourself because you can't afford to pay somebody to do stuff. It's like, a you know, now uh, owning a couple of properties, you know, we rent them out or whatever. Something goes wrong. I'm in there with a wrench. I don't How hard can it be? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I look at that like I've met a lot of drunk mechanics that were dumb shit bastards that make a good living as a mechanic or a plumber or whatever. So I look at that and go, no offense to those guys, but how hard can that be? Yeah. So through that, I've learned how to do a lot of stuff and, and, um, and being, I guess, mechanically minded somewhat, uh, I'm not afraid to take anything apart and put it back together and think it's not going to work. Hmm, sure. So, and just common sense, you look at something, oh, this is the part that's worn. So you can either trim it down and make it work again, or if it's that crucial of a, a fitting, it needs a certain tolerance, then you have to replace that part. Sure. But, so I would say tools as far as learning how to fix your own stuff and, and uh, by being – you know, like I say, being broke forever and, and not being able to afford to get things done, the guitar breaks, well, I got to fix it. What, what's wrong with it? I got to figure that out. Yeah, it forces you to be industrious. When, right. Uh, yeah, that, uh, I agree well, with him. Say, you know, not some not mechanic car tools. I mean, I love cars and stuff and playing with them. I got an old 53 Studebaker that I jack with and, you know, so I'm into that stuff too. But um, I build stuff. I fix broken chairs. uh it doesn't matter what it is. Tables. I fixed a grandfather clock, uh, a small one that sits on a mantle. Fell off a shelf the other day. It was my wife's grandparents, and it fell off a shelf in the garage. The cat knocked it over. I was so just thinking. I bet the cat did it because his cats knock stuff off all the time like that. <laughs> but of course, the thing just blew up when it hit the ground. It fell about eight feet. Yeah. So luckily, it was all wood and old dry glue. So I just cleaned the glue off, reglued it, clamped it back together. Tip top, perfect now. There you go, man. You know, where a lot of guys wouldn't know to, how to do that, you know? It's like, well, it came apart this way, so it can only fit. These parts can only fit one way or the wrong way, you right, know? Right, right, right. So I, I learned a lot of that kind of stuff. And so in that way, I think uh, good tools are, are a huge asset. For sure, man. What's your uh, biggest business or personal win? Biggest personal or business or personal personal win. win would be marrying my wife this wife i have now and business my um i say paying off my house that's it that is nice any hobbies or interests outside of music uh old cars 
That's a common thing. A lot of guitar players are into cars. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's yeah it seems common. like it. Yeah. Hey, what's your favorite place you've traveled, man? You've been all over 10 times. Favorite in musically or pretty or... It's a place you feel nice, place you feel good at. Mm. Well, other than home, <laughs> <laughs> I'd say maybe Norway. You know, that's... Clean. that's it's interesting that you say that because you said that you so obviously you really like being home, yet you've been a road warrior for since you're thirteen pretty much seventeen for sure, yeah, yeah, and now that I'm older is is like that's why i'm I'm liking my home and what I have and being here with my wife and you know for the bulk of that, I was a single guy, and I was married for eleven years prior to this wife and then uh we had some, she ended up dying of cancer, but so we had a bunch Sorry, of problems man. and, and, uh, uh, what went with that. So of course I was on the women haters club for about 10 years, the president. Mm. And, uh, then I met my wife and, you know, it's, it's awesome. It's great. And all of that. So, uh, I would say as far as being a single guy, when I was single, I didn't own anything. I didn't want anything. I wanted to travel I wanted to learn and meet people and all that. So I didn't want to accumulate anything at all other than vintage gear yeah. uh, to make money as, you know, uh, I get to play them and I can flip them and make money and that's awesome, you know, and they don't take up much room, all of that. So I never wanted to buy any property or have a house or fill it up with stuff or none of that until I met my first wife. And then at that point it was like, okay, now I'm married and, I got to try and make her happy. And instead of living in, on milk crates, well, we got to have a couch, you know, sure. where before it was a milk crate and a, and a towel over the window. That's good enough for me or a flag. You know, that was fine back in the, those days. Sure. So, and then now as time goes on, I'm in this place and it's awesome house and, you know, it's mine and my wife's a nurse. So, uh, if it's missing an eye or a limb, we'll end up with it. So everything we got to <laughs> stuff and, couple of horses we got chickens turkeys geese uh dogs cats we had a couple of donkeys for a while and you know so we got all kind of animals and a little farm which i i never thought i'd ever be any of that kind of building a paddock for horses and you know making a chicken coop and putting wire over the top so the raccoons and the hawks can't get in you know, I shot a bobcat here a few months ago cuz he broke into the chicken coop killed a turkey so I had no choice, you know, sure, sure. if I let him go, he'd have come back, you know, so yeah. that kind of stuff. And uh, so I, a bunch of that kind of normal. Now I'm a, like almost like a farmer guy. Yeah, man, you're finding a life, which is yeah. a, a great story, man. How'd you meet your wife? Uh, she was living in Austin in a neighbor of hers that she'd known for 30 something years, a guy had had a probably a couple of wives and a son that's grown up and gone now, but they were friends forever. And, uh, he's a guitar player, a little bit electronic engineer retired. And so he's a guitar stalker in town. He goes and watches guys play and loves guitar players. So he goes around, he'd been watching me play forever since I come to town. So he'd been telling her, Oh, you got to see this guy. He's great. Trying to get her to go out and see some music. Cause she, you know, stayed home, homeschooled her kids worked at all of that in her life and her kids, you know? So, uh, finally, like kids are growing, starting to get gone. So, okay, I'll go out. We'll just go out. So she'd go out and listen to guy, you know, music. So, uh, introduced me to her. And I, of course, I thought she was his. And, uh, so they came to probably, I don't know, half a dozen gigs. And I guess she must've thought I was funny or something. So, uh, she shows up at a, at a couple of gigs on her own or with her girlfriend. Oh. I said, hey, where's Ray? Uh, he's not here. Well, I know. Where is he? Oh, well, he's probably at home. So about the third time, you know, Ray and I aren't dating. We're not, we're not a couple or nothing. Oh, I, said, oh, I didn't know that. So ting, I guess she came to see me for me. There you go, but, man. So that was that. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> So you married the president of the Red Volkart fan club? I guess so. <laughs> Good for well, you, man. After gig, see, I'm sitting with these two gals that I'm 
one's a manager and one's a booking agent person. She didn't know that. Yeah. So I'm sitting these two gals. She, her crowd went out with Ray and all those guys and went out and left. It was the end of the gig, end of the night. So we're pack up and I'm sitting down uh, collecting the money and and uh, here she come in here, hands me a little slip of paper, shaking and says, uh, 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 "If you'd ever like to uh, have a have a coffee, uh, give me a call sometime." With her phone number on it. That's awesome, man. Scared to death, you know. So I called her that night when I got home. We talked for a while and set up a date, and that was the end of it. It's all that's, over now. That's awesome, Red. That's a really good story. I'm happy that you're getting all that. <laughs> you're living, man. Look at you, Red Volcart, living like a domesticated, you know, settled guy. Good for you, man. Living I'm happy. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm happy. It is. It is awesome. I'm very happy yeah, for I've you, been man. A city guy, my whole life, living in towns and cities, and renting a bedroom off of people just because it was cheap. I sure. never. Ran it out a whole apartment unless I leased out the other four rooms, sure. you know, to, so I could pay for my rent for free. Mm -hmm. I did that a couple of times in Nashville, but prior to that, I'd always rent a room and live in a city because that's where all the work and the music was. Mm. So to now be, I'm out in the country. We got five acres out here. Good for you, man. Quiet, dark at night, and, you know, all of that. It's just like, wow, it's awesome. And uh, in a way, it's kind of back to where I, when I was a kid. It was that kind of thing. When I was a little kid, right. we were sort of rural, and, and same thing. Everybody out here in my little neighborhood is five acres between each house, you know, so it's great. That's wonderful, man. I'm, I'm, that's a really nice story. I'm really happy for you. But you know what, though? You are kind of, I mean, not to me, but I understand why people would be intimidated by you a little bit. I don't see that. Maybe. Oh, no, you ha come on. No, I don't. I really don't. Because you're very you're, at the you're, player, the rest of the guys out there, and and I've been lucky and had some good gigs, and that's about it, you know. Other than that, I'm just trying to get along with everybody else. <laughs> no, I, I I feel you, but I, you're very direct. I'm the I'm that way, and I and people sometimes would, especially when I was younger, they would be a little bit. Oh, I don't know how to approach this guy, so I could see why you know. Eric Johnson or or your wife would be a little funny, you know, not sure how you're going to react because you're so direct. And when sometimes when people are really direct, because I know, you know, you're like, oh, my God, I don't know how that. Whereas like, but when you're very direct, you want that out of another person because, you you know, you don't want to waste time. You want to know where you stand. Well, if they you like it, it's fine. If they don't like it, it's fine. Just get, please just tell me. Don't dick around exactly. yeah, yeah. I, I, totally i'm that like yeah. yeah don't like it i'm okay with that too. totally absolutely you don't have to come around absolutely absolutely but just you know uh, don't was it? yeah don't piss on my back and tell me it's raining out exactly <laughs> you know that but yeah. so i get i get it man uh if heaven exists what do you want what do you want to hear god say when you arrive at the pearly gates did you bring your amp? <laughs> Did you bring your amp? <laughs> Red, be best response to that question I've ever had. Did you bring your amp? That's classic, man. Thank you. Did you bring your amp? I love that, man. Literally, best response to that question ever. Uh, last question, man, and I cannot thank you enough. You you're just a wonderful guy, man. Uh, what's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years? I'm calm down. I'm not as hot headed. I don't think my wife might beg to differ, but so I, yeah, I think I've calmed down. Where before I, you know, I, I, I guess I still a little bit that way. I mean, I wouldn't back down from nothing. I don't give a shit who it is or how big they are. If they're wrong, they're wrong, and that's the end of it. You know, sure. I'm I'm that way, and I, I've had plenty of lickings before, and I'm probably not over them yet. You know, I hope I am at my no, age. I think you are. I think you're over. But, I think you're too, you're smarter well, than that now. You know, I mean, if yeah. somebody pisses me off in the car on the highway, I ain't afraid to get out of the car and say, "All right, let's get this shit over with." <laughs> no problem. I don't have any road rage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't carry a gun in the car yet. <laughs> yet, well, you got to get your concealed carry. Yet, <laughs> but yeah, I think I've calmed down as far as letting shit go, and 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 like you said earlier about life's too short. Yeah. Uh, for all the the stress and the worry, and the, you know, if you get mad at something or some something somebody does, you carry that and you go, oh, "That motherfucker, that really bugs me." Now I'm like, you know what? That's on him. Yeah, a hundred percent. 
So, and I don't, I don't want that like a good, a nice little example for me last night, a guy come up to me that's a guitar player in town here. And when I first moved here, when I was in Nashville, he said, Oh man, if you move here, it'd be great. we we'll, we hang out all the time and be awesome. And, uh, Bro, let me know. So when I and and you know this was before I even thought about moving. It'd be great if you came out here. And I'm saying, oh, I'm thinking about maybe moving. So I called him up and I said, yeah, I think I'm going to move out there. I mean, there was silence for 20 seconds on the phone. I said, you still there? He said, yeah. Great, that's great. You're coming out. So I get out here. I don't hear a word from the guy. And so I call him up after about three weeks and say, hey man, I'm. I'm here. I'm looking for work. You know anything? Anything around? You got any extra stuff you can't do, or you're double booked? Let me fill in. I'll be. I'll be your whatever. You know. Yeah. Here, let me do it. Let me help you out. Or whatever. I need some work. Yeah. 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 Sure, man. Yeah. Never hear from the guy. Nothing. So typical. Like I said earlier about other guitar players aren't going to call you because you might get their job. So time goes on. Uh, about a year or so goes by. I'm playing six nights a week, seven nights a week in town, playing all the time. He comes and sees me and uh, says, oh, man, you still got that 66 Telecaster? Yeah, yeah, I still have it. Man, I've been wanting that thing for 10 years. Would you sell it? I thought, yeah, I'll sell it to you, sure. I got plenty of guitars. You want it real bad. You're a great player. You deserve it. So I gave him a really good deal on it. I said, but if you ever sell it, let me know. Because I'd like to have it back. Because it's a '66. It doesn't weigh nothing. It's got a nice fat neck. Sounds great. Rings like a piano. Blah blah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sure. Sure. About four years later, some guys from uh, Sweden. One friend of mine calls me up and says, "Hey, I'm, I'm, can I come over? I want to buy some parts, some Gibson parts." I said, oh, yeah, come on over. So he brings a guy with him, and this friend, he says, hey, I just bought one of your Telecasters. Oh, my said, God. Really? What, what is it? He said, it's a 66, and it doesn't weigh anything. I said, where'd you get it? He said, oh, I got it at Austin Vintage Guitar. Really? He said, yeah, it was on consignment. Some guy had it for sale. I said, what'd you give for it? He said, I'd give, I think it was four grand or something like that. And I said, really? Wow. Good for you. That's a good deal. Because they were going for uh, maybe six, mm. and it had a strap, strap hole in the middle. That's why it was cheaper underneath the pick guard. Mm. They had a strap pickup in the center at one time that I did, so I butchered it up. But I was never going to sell the guitar, so I didn't mind doing it. Sure. And so he's tickled to death to get this guitar because I owned it and all this. And it's like, oh, great. Good for you. And I right away I went, God damn it. That guy, you know, pissed I me off. So I was just like livid because and just like my temper was like, fuck, you know, mad at this guy. So I called him up and I said, hey, uh, you still got the telly? He said, no, nah, actually, I sold it. I said, really? Like that. And he goes, yeah, I know. I said, well, you're supposed to call me and let me know if you wanted to sell it ever that I'd get it back. He said, yeah, I know. I fucked up. Sorry, man. I was like. So you don't sorry man over that, you know? Well, that I was is, surprised. It was nice of you that you even sold it to him in the first place, that he was such a dick to you. Eh, you know, it's I just I I guess I'm kind of a sap for people, I guess, somewhat. Mm -hmm. I mean I'm lenient and obviously lenient, but I'm you know, and I stand back and I watch and I see how people are, but I understand the boldness of yeah, I might get one of his gigs, and that scares him. I get that. That's okay. You know, so I'm, I can't be mad at him for that. But I put him in that box with all the other guys yeah. that like that, you know. But he's a great player, and he's a real good guy, really, other than that. So, yeah, I'd let him have that guitar. Why not? He's yeah. awesome, you know. So, anyway, he sold it. It was gone. Sorry, man. Uh, I guess I fucked up, you know. Like, yeah. <laughs> if it was me and I up like that i would at least offer say hey i got 3500 for it the store got 500 i got 35 for it you gave it to me for 15 yeah split the profit let's split the profit right right here's a thousand bucks right 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 yeah 
not a word about no, it. No, that's not, expecting way too know? much, man. So but, I've, been, I've been carrying that for about 10 years. So last night, I see him here and there, you know, hey, how you doing? Oh, good. Guitar questions, this and that, blah, blah, you know. But I'm a bit more standoffish. Last night, hey, just the guy I've been wanting to talk to. Hey, I heard you carve necks. You'll take a big neck and shave it down. You did that for some guys in town. I said, yeah, I do that. Yeah. He said, oh, that's awesome. He said, I got this telly that it's a newer one, a kit one that he put together or somebody else did. And he said, the neck's really big, and I, I just don't like the big necks anymore, I guess. I'd like to take it down. I said, oh, I'll do it. You know? Oh, really? I said, yeah, let's bring it over one day. We'll cut her down. It won't take two hours. We'll have it done without paint, new paint on it, you know? Really? I said, yeah, it's real easy to do. You know, it's not a big deal. You just take some scra cabinet scrapers and rip the wood off. Feel the shape. You like it. You're happy. We're done. It's woodwork. 101, you know. Hmm. So he's like, oh, awesome. Well, I'll, I'll call you. So he gets his phone out and looks in his phone. He's had my number. I knew he had my number. And I've had the same number for 17 years I've been here. Looks in his phone. He can't find my number. Oh, man. Said, Here's my card. Give me a call when you clean out your wallet, you know. So, uh, oh, man, I, I thought I had it in here. I, I can't find it. I said, oh, probably new phone. You know. So you you probably felt good for yourself that you were able to let that go. Yeah, but I also got another kick in the balls right then by him not having my number in his phone. It means he threw it away at some point. I don't know when, but. Yeah, yeah. You know, but I still said, yeah, bring it over. I'll do it. So I guess I've let go of some of that kind of where normally I would have held that first part about the, the guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or maybe even the first part before that about not calling. Not for calling game. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even to be friends and hanging out. Hey, buddy, it'd be glad that you're in town, even yeah. though you're competition. Let let's hang out and visit. Right. Yeah. Let's not go even get a, right. Let's go grab something to eat, grab a beer, whatever. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So not only that, not only the guitar deal. Now, will you cut the snack down for me? Yeah, sure. Oh, I haven't got your number. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Like, okay, but I'll do it. I yeah, don't mind. I get it. Like I say, I'm over that shit, and it's he's the one that got to know what he done and, and what that is. Yeah, he's got to look at himself in the mirror and realize he fucked up. And that pain, hopefully, you know, whatever. It's not yeah, your problem. But I may bring a little of that up when he comes over here to cut the <laughs> Well, so and, hey, and there'll be nothing wrong with that. Not at all. Uh, that might be my little bit of a sword, you know? No, be nothing wrong with that. Especially if you, you know, hey, I was upset because, boom. And, you know, the nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah. Well, good for you. Yeah, man. but I probably won't, you know, because like 100 years from now, it won't fucking matter, no, you know? It certainly won't. Yeah, when I, you know, he doesn't have any kids. I don't have any kids. So none of that shit will matter when we're gone. Yeah. You know? So it's like, why well, hang on to it? Good for Who, you, man. So yeah, I think I've learned how to do that more as far as my what what have I learned about myself? I've learned how to let some of that I guess grudge, anger, you'd call it maybe. Sure. Let some of that go, you know. Well, good for you, man. You're a better person because of that. Well, I hope I hope I am, you know. Yeah, well, you are cuz you don't carry that shit around so you feel 100 pounds lighter. Well, that's a plus. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, man, let me tell people how they could find you. First of all, you're a lovely guy. You're everything I thought you were going to be, man. And I really appreciate you as a person. And thank right. you for spending this time. And thank you so much for being so candid and sharing all your stories. And I would love to run into you in person. I will call your ass if I'm around there. Don't worry. Right. <laughs> I promise. <Beautiful>. And I will <laughs> I will listen to you play guitar. And I will hang out with you. Um, Greg, thank you. I want to tell people how to find you. It's Red Volkart. Let me spell it. It's R-E-D-D-V-O-L-K-A-E-R-T, redvolkart.com, and also on Facebook, Red Volkart Music. Again, it's R-E-D-D-V-O-L-K-A-E-R-T.com and Red Volkart Music on Facebook. Red's got uh, two or three, three CDs? Uh, four. Technically, I have four CDs out. Great. He's got four. Uh, the first two were on high tone. The third one was on high tone. 
but they were too cheap to make a new one, so they picked half the tunes off the first and second one and added two new tracks and called that a third CD. So, yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's a greatest hits hybrid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they're all available yeah. on your website, right? Yes, they are. Please check out Red um, online and, and send him some money and buy stuff from him. He's a tremendous player. He's just a fantastic guy. And you know what, man? I saw you playing some blues on YouTube, and I was blown away because I said, man, I wonder if this guy can – say I wonder, but I wanted to hear you play the blues because that's not what you're normally known for. And I was like, holy oh, shit. Oh. Holy shit, he was ripping it. I mean, it just sounded great. And you know what? Your singing voice was really good. Well, thank you. I was like, wow, this is impressive. <laughs> I thought I sounded like a pig under a gate. No, it sounded good, man. You sound, you played them blues. It sounded great, man. So well, listen, man, thank you again for everything. If I could ever help you, please you know, reach out. So everybody, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Red as much as I did. Red, again, thank you for everything, man. You're a peach of a guy. Go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get notified of future episodes along with some cool stuff we're coming out with soon. Uh, be nice. Go play your guitar and have some fun. That's what it's all about. Till next time, peace and love, and I am out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. Thank you.